This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. What's up, what's up? Real MVPs, Ricky Widmer here, along with Sean Anderson. Hello. Ah, it's, it's, it's a greeting. Yeah, it's pretty that simple. It's a greeting. It's, it's a pretty very simple, simple one. Hello. Boilerplate. Hello from Sean and myself. You are watching or listening to the Onside Kick podcast here on Most Valuable Podcast. This is the Hold Us To Em prediction. Usually it's Mark and I, but since Mark left, Sean has stepped in and kind of uh, said, Hey, Ricky, huh? I'll when, do what you need to do. When the dad leaves to go get cigarettes <laughs> and doesn't come back, the oldest child has to step up. Bada yeah. bing. And that's Sean, the mm-hmm. oldest. Dave's not old. He, he might act. Dave's not a child. He, you guys, are, you guys well, are my yeah, two dads. You're yeah, my um, two dads. But Mark left. Sean has been filling in on the um, onside kick since then. But before we get into these predictions, I wanted to start with this is also a very sentimental onside kick because... This is the last onside kick for right now um, on MVP as we haven't made the announcement yet. I was waiting for this podcast after today, the onside ca- or the onside kick, I almost said the onside cast, the onside kick will be discontinued Goodbye. because we are starting a new podcast. The thing I wanted to ask you, Sean, is should we reveal what the new podcast is or make them wait till next week? I think we should make them wait. Okay. Make I think a, we make should definitely wait. make them wait because it's pretty Make them wait sick. till next week. It's but a pretty slick logo, mm-hmm. pretty good name. Next week will be the first episode of what is kind of taking the onside kicks place. And if you're a football fan, don't think that your football news and stuff is going awry. If there's some big football news, I'm going to want to talk about it, so I may do a video. Awry is not the right word. Uh, away? Away is away. the right word. Because <laughs> awry means like it's going crazy or something, Yeah, it got right? spoiled. Yeah. Um, this one, it's not going away. I mean, if there's big football news, I'll talk about it. What's your fantasy now can dive into more of that football stuff instead of kind of tiptoeing around, oh, well, Ricky made his opinion on this one. Can't really make it here, so we're just... Consolidizing is that the word I'm looking for? Consolidate. Consolidate. That's you need the word to go I, back to school, dude. I do. Like school, school's gonna be starting up, and I'm gonna be teaching soon. Uh, I gotta learn how to speak words. You'd think doing a podcast would help that. No. But just wanted to make that announcement that the onside kick is discontinuing, and we got a new podcast next week for you guys that I hope you all enjoy. But this is the prediction podcast where we make the predictions for every single division in the NFL, and then at the very end we make our playoff predictions, and the very end of the podcast, somebody, some lucky team, gets a little kiss, a kiss of death. We'll find out who that will be. Make sure to check us out on patreon.com backslash most of podcast. If you want to support us, help us get a new studio. But let's start with the AFC. Sean almost called you Mark, but Sean mm, we will start with the North, then go to the South, then go to the East then the West. Then we'll do the whole thing over. So let's start with the North. We'll give each of ours and then talk about it. What are your standings for the AFC North in 2019? So coming in first and winning the AFC North is the Cleveland Browns at 10 and 6. They'll go 4 and 2 in the division and go 6 and 2 at home and 4 and 4 away. The Ravens, I have them finishing in second, 9 and 7, 5 and 1 in the division, 5 and 3 at home and 4 and 4 away. Steelers 8 and 8, 4 and 4 at home, 4 and 4 away, and the Bengals at 3 and 13, 1 and 7 at home and 2 and 6 away. So, I'll do the same thing that you just did with the aways and homes, but leading it off, I've got the Baltimore Ravens, they're a 10 and 6 team in my mind, 7 and 1 at home, 3 and 5 on the road, 4 and 2 in the division. Then the Steelers coming in second at 9 and 7. Again, 4 and 2 in that division, but 6 and 2 at home, 3 and 5 on the road. The Browns right behind them also at 9 and 7, 4 and 2 in the division, 6 and 2 at home, 3 and 5 on the road. And then the Bengals, the lowly Bengals, 2 and 14. They're not going to win a single division game. They will win both of their games at home, go 2 and 6 and go 0 oh and 8 on the the road. I will ask you which team you want to start with here because the Bengals are interesting, but also the Browns Ooh, are interesting. No, the Bengals are not well, interesting. They're interesting because they're going to be interestingly bad this year. Uh, let's start with the the team that has been in the basement forever, 
and I have them winning the division the and with the most probably lightning rod of a quarterback <laughs> in Baker Mayfield, that's the right place to start right mm-hmm. there in Cleveland. Well, what are your oh, thoughts on them? Well, I think you're going to go 10 and 6. <laughs> I think they're going to win the division. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is I, I'm not too huge on Freddie Kitchens. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have high expectations for him exactly. But the talent on this team is massive that I don't think he needs to do anything major to really make this team a great team because the talent there is is f- fantastic. And I think you do have a true leader in mm-hmm. Baker Mayfield. And you look at that offense and the weapons they have, Nick Chubb, uh, Baker Mayfield, Jarvis Landry, Odell Beckham Jr., main four out there and a pretty decent offensive line. Nothing great, definitely not like top 10 in, in the NFL, but definitely serviceable, probably in that you know top 15, definitely not bottom the, uh, or bottom half of the league. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that they are a, a pretty good offense solid wise. And I think Kitchens was doing a really well a really good job of uh, putting Baker in the right spots last year. I don't know how he will do as a head coach, but I think he'll do enough to make them go 10 and six. I think he being Baker, his leadership, his attitude is exactly what you need in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. I was absolutely wrong on that when he first came out and, and in the draft. I was wrong on my judgment of him. I was wrong on, on his fit in Cleveland. I think after seeing what they did last year and seeing how he's kind of picked up that mantle for Cleveland has been awesome, and I think that he is just going to be able to be that leader that hasn't been there for, what, 22 years now, 21 years mm-hmm. now, ever since they moved back to Cleveland after uh, Baltimore took their franchise. Um, so I think they finally have that true leader out there where it might hide some of the deficiencies that Freddie Kitchens might have right now as a head coach, and he might grow into that role um, just the more he gets uh, you know, in, in, in tune with that job, being his first head coaching job. I think the the just having that leader out there on the offensive side is huge, and they also have that same leader on the defensive side uh, in Miles Garrett. I think that he's, he's going to be a, a massive – pin in in that defense where he is a guy that you know he hasn't put up those massive stats yet but you can Mm -hmm. just see him he's quick off that line he's consistently creating havoc in the backfield he's not racking up massive numbers yet like Aaron Donald or you know JJ Watt but he's gonna be the next big thing but he's definitely going to be yeah one Mm -hmm. one of the elite to premier defensive players in the league and then you also have a great secondary as well led by Denzel Ward yeah and the thing that I looked at when I was going through these game by games is Last year, Cleveland was not very good on the road, and I kind of, I kind of reflected that in my predictions. Were but if I look at them, and you look at them, the Saints game, twenty-one to eighteen. If their kicker would have actually made a couple kicks, they win that game. Um, at Oakland, a really close overtime game that probably the Browns should have mm-hmm. won, but the Raiders came out and pulled out the W. Another overtime game in Tampa Bay that was just right there for Baker and this team. Um, the Pittsburgh game was a bit of a blowout, but like um, Houston was a bit of a blowout, but then at Baltimore, a two point loss. So it's like there's three of those. Those flip or four of those. They flip the other way. This is a team that's not only three wins on the road. Well, and they, I mean, they almost, you know, had you even just look at the tie as mm-hmm. well. I mean, that, yeah, you, you make another kick in that one, mm-hmm. you have another win. I know that one was a, a home game. Yeah. Um, but you could, you could definitely see this team. And the way that they played and the way that they ended that year last year, they were definitely not a seven and eight team. Like, mm-hmm. like they had a, a huge step up after they fired Hugh Jackson. Once Baker took over that mantle, and once he finally got consistent reps out there, I mean that team really looked like a well-oiled machine. I think the mm-hmm. biggest thing that plays into their favor is they still are facing. I think, I mean, they're not facing a number, a, a, a division winner uh, schedule right now. They're still facing one of the lower. Uh, levels of of these. Uh, I mean, of, of these de- of these schedules. I mean, you look. They're they're playing the Bills. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, wait. Uh, it's tricky. So they've yeah, they got the, the NFC what are the a- NFC West and the AFC East are the two divisions where mm-hmm. the NFC West. Yeah, you get the Cardinals, who should be a win in my mind. You get a team like the 49ers, which will be interesting. Jimmy Garoppolo coming back, but then you play the Rams and the Seahawks. Good thing though, you Garoppolo get those teams back? at home. Well, he was injured last year. Oh, coming back off an of injury. Gotcha. I was like, um, coming back to Cleveland. Yeah. But, I mean, um, good thing about the Rams and Seahawks, although I still see those as losses, you get them at Cleveland, which is way better than playing them in L.A. or Seattle. Mm-hmm. The AFC East is the wild card to me because, like, the way I see their, the road games, the five road games that I have them losing, Pittsburgh and Baltimore, I just see them splitting. Like, they'll split with those teams – Beat the Bengals twice. That's how they get to four and two. 
But the other road games, like, are they going to go into, I know they're coming off a bye, but are they going to go into Foxborough and get the better end mm-hmm. of the Patriots? Are they going to be able to walk into, I think that, and these are kind of two of my steel games, is like, week number two, what if the Jets, coming off a win week one, are feeling the hype at home, yeah. they get a win on Cleveland in New York? Yeah, You've and, got and, the 49ers coming off a bye, you're playing them in San Francisco, like, can you get it done against those teams who are going to be playing at home in front of their home crowds? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ones that I have them losing are against higher up teams mm-hmm. than you know the Jets. I have them losing to the Ravens at uh, at at Baltimore. Yeah, Broncos at Baltimore or at, at Denver, at New England, and then at Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, I have them losing to the Titans uh, to start off the season. I think that this team isn't going to be fully ready to go yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, I have them losing there, and they have them losing against the Rams too. Though, so those those, those are the six losses I have: uh, Titans, Rams, Ravens, Patriots, Broncos, Steelers. All teams that have been in the playoffs in the recent re- past recent years, and mm-hmm. that's the, those are the teams I think that they will lose to. I do have them having a two and three record against teams with winning records. So you know, for the Browns team that has not been that great recently, you know, almost going five hundred against those winning teams, that's going to be huge. And I think they do take care of business against those bad teams or the yeah. worst teams like the Jets, the Cardinals, the Bengals. I think they're going to be able to take uh, a care of damage there. And I do have them taking a pretty big win uh, at home against Seattle. I think they'll be coming off uh, two. I think I think they'll be finding their footing at least after that Ravens loss. Mm -hmm. I think that they'll go to San Francisco, get a pretty big win off a team that's coming off a bye, and then going back to Cleveland before the bye week, I think they're going to go balls out and and take take a game against uh, Seattle there. Um, But, yeah, I mean, you look at what they're actually going up against. They go up against the Titans team that was third last year in the Mm -hmm. the AFC Which I'm perplexed by the Titans. We'll get to them later. Yeah, but the only reason why I have them losing that game is just because it's week one. Mm -hmm. If that was a later game, I think they they probably take that, and I think it's going to be a close game. Yeah, I'm on the same boat. We're up until week nine. They're going to win one game. And I know that Browns fans are going to be like, whoa, what's going on here? I think this is a team that it's not necessarily a, whoa, what's going on? They're just playing better opponents and maybe get one stolen away from them on the road to where they will find their groove. Like, after week nine, I've got them losing one game. Like, this is going to be a tale of two mm-hmm. halves of the season where against losing opponents, they're seven and one for me. Against winning, they're two and six. And I think that's the thing. You've got them in the playoffs. I don't. But if they miss the playoffs, I think it's going to be like, okay, they're close. They they did better than what they did last year, but now they got to do better against those teams that have winning yeah, records. Yeah, that's the difference. I have them three and five mm-hmm. after week nine. So I have yeah. them uh, going. Yeah, so going into that Bills game, I have them three and five, and then mm-hmm. I have them only losing one game after that. Yeah, and I think that when you're making when you're doing stuff like this, you have to find storylines that are feasible and that mm-hmm. are definitely you know creatable, and. I think the Browns are a very good team both on both sides of the ball. I think that they're going to struggle early just because of the lack of leadership in the coaching staff, but I think Baker will be able to realize that and kind of pick their this team up. And I think you can kind of definitely see a story being written where this team starts off very slow and everyone's mm-hmm. like, oh, here we go again. We built up the Browns too much. But I, I think people do have a pretty good gauge on the, t- the, the talent that this team does have. And I think once it comes to that Week 10 where they're playing a little bit lesser opponents – you know, the Bills are a good team, but the the Browns definitely do have a good enough offense to mm-hmm. slow down Josh Allen. Baker's a good enough quarterback to, I think, put enough pressure on that Bills defense, and it is in Cleveland, so I think that's what's going to be the decider there. And then they play the Steelers. I'm not high on the Steelers. It's also in well, Cleveland. Then they play the Dolphins. I'm not high on the Dolphins. I think they win there. They're playing the Bengals. They win there. They play the Cardinals. They win there. They're playing lesser teams in that back half, and I think that's what's going to really make up for it. Well, I was going to ask you, we're kind of in agreement of – the Bengals being in the cellar. The Ravens, I think, are going to be like, we know what the Ravens are. They're going to be 10 and 6, 9 and 7, maybe 11 and 5 if they um, outplay their coverage in football terms or kind of um, succeed more than many of us think. Let's end the North segment with the Steelers because they're a team to me that I wanted to put at 10 and 6. But then, like you said, they're like, yeah, Juju's good. James Conner is a good year last year, but like this team could struggle this year. And you said the magic word. You said Mike Tomlin losing the locker room, mm-hmm. and I was like, Sean, I'm with you. Nine and seven well, missing the playoffs. It's not only that I think that's possible that they can lose the um, that Mike Tomlin can lose mm-hmm. the locker room. I'm not saying it's a guarantee that he will, but I think it's possible that he could just because 
yes, you got rid of some, or maybe not some, but a lot of negativity and toxic, toxicity with yeah. Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell leaving. But I think the biggest thing is that you, you lose Mike Munchak, and he is a phenomenal offensive line coordinator, and you have an aging Ben Roethlisberger and an offense that just seemed to be lapsing and giving James Conner the ball consistently enough. Mm-hmm. And yes, he was injured, but you see in the back half of the year when they stopped giving him the ball more consistently, they ended up going, you know, three and two, but they didn't have that same pop and they were playing worse teams like Jacksonville, like Cincinnati. They were blowing games like against the Chargers and they weren't consistently getting their offense going because they weren't getting James Conner involved enough. In those last five games, he was only averaging about 13 carries, 13 touches a game, and he was injured, so I definitely do want to make that clarification because I know some people will get upset if I don't. But the you know previous eight games before that, he was only getting 19 touches mm-hmm. and didn't have the same offense when Jalen Samuels was out there and getting touches consistently. I think that if Conner gets injured, this offense can really flop. Even if Connor's healthy, I don't know if he's going to have the same holes that he did last year. And not having Antonio Brown there is going to make Ben Roethlisberger's job much harder, and he's much older than he was. And he's not a guy that's aging gracefully. Mm-hmm. And I think this year might be that cliff year for Ben Roethlisberger. So I think the loss of Mike Munchak will be huge. I don't know if Mike Tomlin's the strongest head coach out there. I'm not in love with their defense because I don't think they have a solid leader out there ever since the loss of Ryan Shazier, unfortunately, mm-hmm. happened. And I think that this offensive line won't be able to open up that much holes, that many holes like they they have been, you know, in previous years when Le'Veon was there and when James Conner was at his best in those first eight games. So while I think they can give t- t- tough teams, you know, difficult times, I still have them going eight and eight. And since they do have more of a tougher schedule, you know, playing the Patriots, the Seahawks, the Ravens, the Chargers, the Colts, um, the Rams, I think that this team will struggle against good teams and beat bad teams. I have them 1-8 against teams with winning records, and I have mm-hmm. them 7-0 and against teams with bad records. I think they'll be able to beat bad teams, which has been pretty much the Achilles heel for this team yeah. for, for the past couple of years. They've usually been able to – they've usually taken their foot off the pedal against bad teams. Mm-hmm. There's so many times where they go into Jacksonville when Jacksonville is bad and they just blow the game. Like, there's so many times where they almost gave up the game against Cleveland when Cleveland didn't have, uh, you know, a good enough team. Well, there were so many times that they almost lost to uh, Cincinnati. And I think that could happen later on, week 16, mm-hmm. when they go into New York to play Le'Veon and his new team. Where the Jets at that time could be feeling all loosey-goosey, like, hey, you know what? Like, we got nothing, not that we got nothing to play for, but we it don't matter if we lose this game because we're not in a playoff hunt. And the Steelers are all rigid, like, oh, man, we need to win this game to stay in that playoff hunt entering Week 17 at Baltimore. I don't see them losing to the Jets. Again, I was saying teams mm-hmm. with losing records are 7-0. and I, I think that when they're, they're going to lose, it's just because they're going to lose against teams that are not only more well put together and mm-hmm. more well run, but just teams that are more balanced offensively. Patriots, and, 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 Chargers, Colts. Yeah, Patriots, Seahawks, Steelers, mm-hmm. Chargers, Ravens, Colts, Browns. Raven, Rams. Ravens again. Um, I think that this team is just going to struggle just to find consistency because mm-hmm. I don't think there's a consistent piece on their team outside of Juju probably because I'm, I'm going to really be questioning that offensive line. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Connor is going to be fully healthy, and if he is, I don't know what his true potential is because he was behind such a good offensive line last year. Mm-hmm. And that defense, I don't know who is the guy on that, that defense. Is it Bud Dupree? Like, I, I don't see... Steeler fans want it to beat Bud Dupree. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know who the guy is on mm-hmm. that defense. I don't think that guy has shined yet, and I think that is going to be difficult when I don't think your actual head coach is a strong enough leader to get you through those tough times. And mm-hmm. the guy that is then your leader de facto after that is your quarterback. And Ben Roethlisberger has shown himself to be a guy that goes out and attacks his teammates. So I think it's definitely possible that the Steelers just aren't able to get off the ground running because of a lack of leadership on this team. Yeah, I just the, the last thing I was going to say is with Juju, like how is he going to do this year? Because last year he had the benefit of, oh, AB's over there. They yeah. got a double AB. They can't double I, us both. I think he'll do well. I mean, Juju's a very mm-hmm. talented player. I just But when he's getting most of the double coverages now compared to I do, AB? I, they rarely double double coverage people. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, they'll probably jam them and they'll probably have, you know, a, a corner take us take him all the way to a safety, I and mean, then the safety will pick him up. I mean, I don't think they're going to scheme around Juju. 
I just think that Juju is the only piece that they will have. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know, late in games, they'll be able yeah. to key in on Juju and obviously try to stop him. Mm-hmm. I don't think Ben's mobile enough either. I think that's another thing. I mean, it, you know, usually ben, when you get older, you can't. Well, yeah, but it also you know, be athletic as you were ben, when you were ben younger. Ben was always the guy that was like, "This guy can't run because he's so big." And then like you'd see him like you know be like a freight train running yeah. through there. Um, I don't think he'll be able to show that mobility enough. Where you know maybe Juju will be open. I just don't know if Ben will be able to get mm-hmm. him the ball. Well, let's move on from the north to the south. Oh, Cam um, Hayward. Steeler fans would be upset if I don't say Cam Hayward. I okay. guess Cam Hayward is definitely their best defensive mm-hmm. player. Um, but he's but, nothing what Ryan Chazier was. No, he to, wasn't. To it, it's defense. tough to be a, a defensive lineman mm-hmm. that leads like that. But, um, yeah. Let's move Just on. Throw, oh, T.J. Watt, too. T.J. Watt. But, well, he's whatever. still young, too. Fuck like it. That's the thing with the Steelers. Fuck it, they suck. Let's move on <laughs> to the south. Yeah. Um, Give yours, I'll give mine, and then we'll talk about it. What are your rundown for the AFC South? In first place, I have the Colts going 10 and 6, Texans going 9 and 7, Jags going 8 and 8, and the Titans going 8 and 8. I think this is going to be a bloodbath of a division. I completely agree with you. I'm at Jaguars at 10 and 6, Colts at 10 and 6, Texans at 9 and 7, Titans at 7 and 9. I think there's not one of these teams finishes like 7 and 9 is the bottom mark. Like they're going to be 7 and 9 and above. I wouldn't even be surprised if Jacksonville, Indy, and Houston were all 10 and 6 at the end of the year. I want to start, though, with these Jaguars because the Texans, their big thing is can they stay healthy? The Colts last year was slow start under Frank Wright's first year, really picked it up at the end. Can they now start mm-hmm. right or right right away? What about Jacksonville, though, that to me. Had a bad year. I'm sorry because I feel like I'm at fault. Everyone and number two, they get Nick Foles, who yeah. is a way better improvement than Blake Bortles. He's an improvement. I, I wouldn't say way better. I, I think he's a way better one. I, than he's Blake more Bortles. consistent, and I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bortles was never giving you consistency, I, and I'm not going to argue. You know, signing Nick Foles over Blake yeah. Bortles. That's that's the right move. But I don't know if Nick Foles saves this franchise like. Jacksonville fans might hope. Like I everyone s- wants them to. I haven't seen them be too much high on, like too high on Nick Foles to where I'm like, all right, slow down your idea of Nick Foles. Mm-hmm. It's just more having someone that is that consistent will take more pressure off the defense, and the defense can be returned to form in that way. You know, we obviously saw what that defense was at its highest peak. It was yeah. the number one defense in the NFL. So that understanding, I understand. You know, I, I definitely can see. But mm-hmm. my biggest concerns on that offense isn't Nick Foles. It's Leonard Fournette and his health. And we've seen him consistently miss time, not only in the NFL, but in college. And if he's not out there, who's the back they're relying on? And I think with Nick Foles, you need to be able to have backs in general to be able to take pressure off of him. We saw in Philadelphia when they won that Super Bowl, they were Mm -hmm. going to like three or four backs that whole entire playoff run and that whole entire season when Carson went, went down. They had to change their offense because Nick Foles wasn't the playmaker that Carson Wentz was. Yeah, the two behind Fournette are Alfred Blue and Thomas Rawls. Yeah, and we've seen both of those guys in roles before in Seattle and Houston, Mm -hmm. respectively, and none of those guys have knocked anyone's socks off. Yeah. They're clearly backup backs. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Jacksonville has enough power to sustain a Leonard Fournette loss to where we're probably in a situation that's similar to last year, but instead of going what four and twelve, six and ten like they did last year, mm-hmm. they improve and go eight and eight. Because I don't trust Leonard Fournette's health. I don't trust his ability to be on on the field. And if he's not available, it's going to make Nick Foles' job extremely difficult with the lack of weapons that he does have. Because who is their number one wide receiver out there? Well, that's also the thing where right now the number one is Marquise Lee coming off of injury. Right now he's on the pup list mm-hmm. as we're recording this. And then after that, it's okay. We remember the year where both your Allens got injured. Now both of them are gone. Yeah. Um, one of them in the team that you have on your sweater. But it's like Marquise Lee's your number one, but he's coming off of injury. You've got Keelan Cole who... Played well last year. Yeah, he had his moments. Doesn't have to be the number one now if Lee comes back healthy. And then for me, what are we going to see from D.D. Westbrook? Is he finally going to have that breakout season since he left Oklahoma or since he got drafted from Oklahoma? Yeah, those are the, the, the last two guys are the guys that I'm more interested in. I don't really think Marquise Lee is an impact player. Mm-hmm. I, I've never seen that out of him. Not only just because he hasn't been able to be available for that team, but I also mm-hmm. have never just seen it from him. I didn't see it from him in college. He was a USC guy, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I never saw it from him. 
so I'm I'm iffy on what he can actually provide, even if he is healthy. So I would actually more look towards D.D. Westbrook possibly stepping up because he was a true playmaker at Oklahoma. And along with that, Keelan Cole had some phenomenal games and phenomenal performances last year where I think that if he finds more consistency, having a more consistent quarterback, then we could possibly see a true number one you know, develop. But I, I think that there is the possibility of this team struggling just due to the lack of running back talent because I think mm-hmm. this is a team that you need to be able to take that pressure off of them. Yeah. I, I don't really see this team offensively being able to be that big of a jump. And I also don't know if Doug Marone's the guy mm-hmm. out there. So taking all that into effect, I mean, we saw what Nick Foles was away from an Andy Reid guy. Mm-hmm. Doug Marone's not an Andy Reid guy. So I think with the lack of running back health and a lot of question marks at that position, no true number one. Like, eh. I mean, he didn't really have a number one out there, but he had like Zach Ertz. He had... Alshon Jeffrey, he had a lot of guys in Philadelphia to help him out. Um, and that's why the thing, I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. the thing is with the receivers, Josh Oliver, rookie they drafted in the third round playing tight end. How well is he going to grasp this as a third round rookie? You've got um, DJ Chark out of LSU, Terrell Pryor, guys that it's like, you're not expecting them to blow their socks off, but can they contribute and will this be something where if the defense gets the job done, Nick Foles spreads the ball around, and Jacksonville comes out with some wins? They have Terrell Pryor. They do. That's a. They got Terrell it's like Pryor. when Luke Skywalker calls him Obi Wan <laughs> Kenobi. Like, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Uh-huh. Yikes. Um, yeah, I def. Now that you said Terrell Pryor out there, I'm definitely less. Confident. confident in their wide receiver position. They did get Chris Conley, who I did, mm-hmm. do think was a good addition. He he showed something in KC before. I In the end, I, I don't know if I trust them enough offensively to do it. And, I thought and, you were going to say, in the end, it doesn't even matter. No, I think I think it's just more... And, and, and with with their offense, I'm, I'm, just, I'm very concerned about what they can do. Their defense is going to be fantastic. That's mm-hmm. what's going to help them win eight games. What about the Texans? This is a team where is the only thing that we need to worry about them as their health. Is that the only thing we need to worry? Them there's, standing no, in their own way. There's three things. You need to worry about health, you mm-hmm. need to worry about the offensive line, and you need to worry about that front office. Because there is no guy in their front office right now. Well, it's Bill O'Brien, I think. There is no guy in their front <laughs> office. They fired their guy after trying to, the draft. Trying to do the Bill Belichick they've, thing. They've done too many things where... They're not trusting of guys. Bill O'Brien's running their their front office personnel guys mm-hmm. out of the building. They are not stable enough, I think, in that front office to make the adjustments midseason to help their team. So automatically, if health's a concern, I don't think they'll be able to address that midseason. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they will be able to do that. They made a move last year for Demarius Thomas, which I don't think people were too upset about, and it was unfortunate that he went down with an injury. But I have not been able to see this team address their team in the right way through free agency and through the draft. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you know, you hit a home run with Deshaun Watson. Kid's a stud. You were able to get Will Fuller. Kid's a stud. You drafted DeAndre Hopkins a long time ago, but this, is, this wasn't that regime. I don't think they have the talent in the front office to get it done to help their actual talent on the team. If Jadavion Clowney is on the field and is healthy, He's going to be an, uh, an absolute monster. He showed that last year. If J.J. Watt is fi- finally fully healthy after playing a full season and is able to stay healthy this year, we already know he's going to be a stud vying for Defensive Player of the Year. I think that those two are probably unmatched when it comes to a one-two punch off the edge of for any team. And as long as Deshaun Watson has help offensive line-wise, he'll be able to get the ball to DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller if they're out there. So I, I think that it just comes down to those three things. If they stay healthy... If their front office is able to right, make the right moves, if they're not staying healthy, and if their offensive line is able to defend uh, Deshaun Watson, this team could easily go 11 and 5, 12 and 4. But I don't think they will be able to do that. I think they make the playoffs still at 9 and 7, but I, I think that this team will definitely have gaping holes and, and clear holes that can definitely affect them when yeah, it comes I'm, to playoff time and late in the season. I'm just confused. The only thing I'm confused about with them is how are they going to be again? Because like, when they're healthy, they can go up against the Saints week one and win. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to be the case because I think the Saints are going to come out Monday night football pissed off that they should have won a Super Bowl. Yeah. And basically, like, they're the gonna Saints have, might actually show up in the like, first four weeks they're gonna of, be in a, of ma- a NFL season. It's gonna, it could be a scary, 
start of the season for the Saints, but like you get the Saints on the road, you get the Chargers on the road. You're playing at Arrowhead. I mean, this division, I have them three and three in the division, but like I have losses at Tennessee, at Indianapolis. Um, yeah, I am going two and six on the road. Yeah, you're also going to Baltimore. It's like this is a tough road schedule. How are they going to get it done? The only reason why I got them winning technically in Jacksonville is because that game's in London. Um, so they don't have to go to Jacksonville for that one. But very quickly before we move on to the East, I did want to give a little bit of time. Colts, it's just I think they're going to be the best team in this division, um, possibly. Um, only way they don't is if like Houston or Jacksonville ties them and or it's if like luck the tiebreakers or if luck goes down. But Tennessee, they weren't a bad team last year but I don't think they're going to be in the competition for the division, whether that's with Mariota or backup Ryan Tannehill if Mariota goes down. Yeah, this is the thing that scared me because Titan fans are ruthless. Really, all of the AFC South is. You guys have some great fans. Jaguar fans are fucking insane with Duval County and all that shit. Um, Texans fans are pretty crazy. Especially if you say Jaguar and not Jaguar. Oh, fuck, we've what, was, gotten, what was I saying? We've gotten comments jaguar. about how it's Jaguar, not Jaguar. It's a Jaguar. What if, I hope I've been I saying it right. That's why ever since know. I've I've made it a point to say Jaguar. Or Jacksonville. Yeah, um, or Jacksonville. But yeah, they, they, they're... Or the Jags. I mean, all these fan bases are crazy, and I know Titans absolutely love Marcus Mariota. Mm-hmm. And I know that... It's the golden boy. He's been able to show everything that you wanted from a young quarterback he's been very efficient in the red zone he's gone to arrowhead and won a big game before and i know i'm supposed to like him like i I know this guy is 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 talented Mm -hmm. i've just never seen it from him and even if he is healthy i don't know if he is the guy to lead this team past Jadavion Clowney and jj watt deandre hopkins and deshaun watson i don't know if he's enough to lead him past andrew andrew luck and the indianapolis colts I don't know if he's enough to take him past the defense of Jacksonville. I don't know if Marcus Mariota is enough, healthy or not healthy, to take this team to where they need to be. And I know that Titans fans will be upset with me. It's absolutely fine for saying that. I get upset if Tom Brady's not a top five quarterback. <laughs> I know what it's like to be a fan. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to say that you know someone questioning your guy. I totally understand that, but I don't know if he is the guy. So when you're going up against teams with really tough defenses and when you're going up against teams that can you know really put pressure on you offensively and they could take the ball away which Marcus Mariota you know has been fairly you know been able to do is keep the team keep the ball in his his offensive hands but if they're able to take the ball away I really think that this team could be in trouble. I think they're going to be able to win games because playing in Tennessee is tough. I think that they have a fairly easy schedule and I think that in the end they go 8 and 8. And I can see them making the playoffs, but I can also see them falling off. Here's my only problem I see with the Titans' schedule, and it has nothing to do with their team. It's their schedule. Out of their 16 games, they are 4-1 and one against losing with teams with losing records. So you might say, oh, that's good. Oh, wait, there's only five of those games? In my mind, how I had everything play out, they're going to play 11 games this year, possible 11 games out of their 16 against teams with winning records. I've and missed 10. Th- and that's what it comes down to. Like, when you're playing that many good teams, you're going to have to bring your A game every single time. And it's like, I don't think you beat the Chargers. I don't think you beat the Chiefs. I know those are both at home. I don't think you beat the Saints. It's Wait, like, it's those teams. I'm a moron. I think I just said they have an easy schedule. They have one of the tougher ones. Yeah, in the I mean, I'm for, stupid. For me, it's they have. Why do people thing listen of, to like, me? <laughs> they are going to play good teams. Even like the eh, the Bills are not a winning team for mine. So that's one of the ones um, that they won. But I mean, they're going to play a lot of teams with winning records in 2019. Mm-hmm. Let's move on into your division, or I should say, your AFC division. Yeah, because it has your quarterback in it. My guy. How many wins does Tom Brady get this year, Sean? I was so tempted to give him 15 <laughs> like I did last year. Uh, I have him going 12-4, and four, which I think is more realistic. I think people could understand because, I mean, this team has just been 12-4, and 11-5, mm-hmm. 13-3 consistently throughout the past, I don't know, 18 years. Yeah. Um, so I have the Patriots going 12-4, and 5-1 and one in the division, 7-1 and one at home, and 5-3 and three away. 3-3 three and three against teams with winning records and 9-1 and one against teams with losing records. 
Bills, I have them going eight and eight. We talked about them already. Mm-hmm. I think this team could be an eight and seven, nine and seven, seven and nine team. I think this team is fairly decent defensively, and I think that Josh Allen will be able to take the steps necessary. Bills going four and two in the division, six and two at home, two and six away, one and five against teams with winning records, and seven and three against teams with losing records. I have the Jets going four and twelve, two and four in the division, three and five at home, one and seven away from MetLife. 0-6 against teams with winning records and 4-6 and with team against teams with losing records. And the team that uh, I think is going to be the worst in the NFL this year, the Miami Dolphins going 2-14, 1-5 in the division, 2-6 and at home, 0-8 away from, uh, what is it, Rock, uh, Hard Rock Hard Rock, Hard Rock Stadium. The uh, Orange 0, Bowl. Yeah, 0-8 against teams with winning records and 2-6 and against teams with losing records. So you and I are different in some ways, not different in other ways. One of the ways we're not different. 12 and 4 for the Patriots. I say it every single year. The Patriots are the hardest team for me to judge because it's like I go through everyone else's schedule first. And by the time I get to the East, it's like, oh, they have 15 wins. This is not going to happen. Like, because every team, it's like, well, the Patriots will beat them. Oh, yeah, the Patriots will beat them. But I got 12 and 4. Then I got the Bills at 7 and 9 coming in second. The Jets at 6 and 10, which we said in our preview was towards. The higher end um, for the Jets this season, and then the Dolphins coming in last place, four and twelve. This is a tricky one. This will probably be our shortest of the preview because both you and I, you stepping in for Mark, stepped in for this division. So we mm-hmm. already gave our huge thoughts about yeah. it um, in that preview. But I want to ask you about the Dolphins because you told me a little a snippet about. Uh, uh, Coach Flores saying uh, who might be the starter for them this year? Yeah, he, he said that Ryan Fitzpatrick right now is currently leading in camp. Uh, so we might see Fitzmagic lead the Miami Dolphins out of the tunnel as their starting, starting quarterback uh, so, week one against the Ravens. So now that we know that or we think that, like we've got a guy that's in the front. Yeah. How do you see their season panning out if Fitz is the guy? Start no one four and Josh Rosen takes over in week six. That's <laughs> about it. It's their bye. It's oh. the way it's playing out. Yeah, They're going I've up against... Him. And you said this in in their preview. Kind They're playing the eat. Ravens, Patriots, Cowboys, and Chargers. Mm-hmm. Those teams are all good. All mm-hmm. of them were either playoff teams last year or really close. I think they were all playoff teams, right? The Raven, did the Ravens make it? Yep. Yeah. All they right. lost to the Chargers. They were all playoff teams. Mm-hmm. So there's no way they're throwing Josh Rosen out there. I think that's what they're saying. Yeah. And after the bye week, they play the Redskins, which is much easier than playing the Ravens, Patriots, Cowboys, or Chargers. So that's how I see it going out. And then I see them winning week one because they actually have a decent quarterback out there. Or week five. Or week mm-hmm. six, sorry. Uh, week one after the bye. Um, I have them winning that game because they'll have a decent quarterback and they'll be able to beat the Redskins. But I only see them beating the Redskins and Bills. Um, I actually have the Jets sweeping them, which I was kind of shocked by. Yeah, but that I, was... I, I think that them coming off of teams that are playing against buys, mm-hmm. like the Bills, the Steelers, I think that's going to make a difficult Week 9 matchup just because they've been playing – you know, two tough teams back to back hard, and then they'll be able to rest up back at home against the uh, the Bills week eleven and take a win. Yeah, I just for me it was hard. Of I knew they weren't going to go zero and sixteen. I knew they were probably going to get at least maybe two or three wins. It's just picking out where those wins were going to happen. And I'm like, you know what? I'll do like last year. They split with the Bills, split with the Jets. I'll give them the home games. The Bengals, they're lucky that they play the Bengals because I'm not too high on them. I can give mm-hmm. you a, a home win there. And the only other win that I'm not sold on but I put in there just to make the numbers work out is beating the Patriots Week 17. I know that's in Foxborough. I yeah. know that's probably not going to happen. They'll probably be 3-13, and 13, not 4-12. and 12. But, like, this is a team where, like you said, probably not going to p- play Fitzpatrick or pro- not going to play – Rosen coming out of it, the gates, he'll play week five and beyond. If the Dolphins beat the Patriots, it's in Miami. That's mm-hmm. no question. They're not beating them in Foxborough. That's all I have to say. What about the other teams? I know we talked about them in the preview. Anything that you need to add to that, or should other should people just look down below and go to our previews for the East? Yeah, I think that's probably what they should do. The I, I'll just throw this out for the mm-hmm. for the Patriots. Um, I think week four is a loss in Buffalo. I think week 11's a loss uh, in Philadelphia. I think week 13's a loss against the Texans in Houston. And then I think week 14's a loss in Can- or against Kansas City. Um, so I, I think that the teams that they're going to lose to are teams that play decent defense or have that revenge factor. Mm-hmm. Chiefs being that revenge factor. Bills have a great defense. Texans have a great defense. Eagles have a great defense. Um, 
I don't think that's really a challenge for them playing a great defense, but going on the road, playing a tough defense is always going to be a challenge for every NFL team. So uh, that's where I have the Patriots losing this year. Let's move on into the West, the last division. How does it pan out for you? Number one, Chargers at 11 and five, wow. five and one in the division, five and three at home, six and two away, three and four against teams with a winning record and eight and one against teams with losing records. I have the Chiefs also going 11 and five, four and two in the division, Five and three at home, six and two away, six and three against teams with winning records, five and two against teams with losing records. I have the Broncos going six and ten, and the Raiders going two and fourteen. Wow, I'm surprised that you've got the Chargers at one. I know the same record, but it's the division. Chargers records. at one, and not the Chiefs. I'm going to be the other way around. Chiefs, they'll be thirteen and three again. I could not budge on them being a very good team. Chargers are right behind them at twelve and four. So kind of like what we saw last year. Then it's basically the rest of the division with the Broncos. Bronco fans and I have a love-hate relationship. Um, new coach think, coming in. I think they just hate you. But they do yeah. because I'm usually low on their team. Um, Quarterback-wise, I don't know if Joe Flacco makes it the whole year. I don't know how good um, Wacky Flacky um, is this year, but 4-12 and is their record. And then there's the Raiders. The, the Hard Knocks curse, whatever you want to call it, 2-14, and 14, they're going to end it. And... That's where I kind of want to look at this. Because, like, the Chiefs and the Chargers, we know they're going to be good. They're going to be playoff teams. Even the Chargers without Melvin Gordon will probably be a playoff team, even if he sits out the entire year. Austin Eckler isn't bad or wasn't bad for them last year. Let's start with the other two teams, the Broncos. What's going through your mind? Will Joe Flacco actually be the quarterback all 16 games. Uh, to be honest, I don't really care about that. I just care about my guy Vic Fangio. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm excited for him. It sucks mm-hmm. that he had to leave. Got to um, play the Bears week two. Yeah, I'm, ex- I'm, I'm excited for Chuck Pagano. I mean, it's literally just straight up the Lions, Patriots week two. Mm-hmm. And in Detroit last year, going up against the old defensive coordinator, Broncos will get the win there. <laughs> um, but I, I think that him finally getting a team is definitely going to be something refreshing. I think you're going to see a really great defense, obviously, out there with Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, and Vic Fangio mm-hmm. leading it. Um, might cover up some of the deficiencies that they have in the secondary outside of you know Chris Harris and I think they're still have Bradley Roby, um, unless he left. Um, but, I mean, they, they, they do have a, a really you know usable secondary, and I think Fangio will be able to cover them up uh, wherever there are deficiencies. And I think that... In the end, this team will be able to beat up on teams with losing records and will struggle against teams with winning records, but they do have a very tough schedule, and that's what's going to be their their kind of fall there is they have one of the tougher schedules in the AFC, playing the Chiefs twice, playing the Chargers twice, mm-hmm. playing the Texans, playing the Vikings, playing the Bears, playing the Packers, playing the Jaguars. Like All of those teams are absolutely going to be tough for them. And I think that while they might win some of them, I haven't won in the Chief, uh, against the Chiefs, I haven't won against the Browns. Um, I think in the end, it's just they're not going to have enough talent mm-hmm. all around, especially at that quarterback position, uh, to put them over the hump. So to answer your question, Bre- uh, Bre- Bradley Roby, not on the team. Go Bears. Um, he is now a Houston Texan mm. um, as of this year. Their top two corners are Chris Harris and Kareem Jackson, who came over from Houston. Okay. That's what our lads has right now. But – for me, the big question is just the offense. Where what you said, Vic fan, like the defense will be fine. The only thing that's going to be a hiccup is like learning the language, learning exactly how things work in a Vic Fangio system. But it's not going to be like, oh my God, this defense is can't get what the defense is. They're going to be still very good out there, especially with Von Miller um, leading it. The thing I wonder is with this offense is how do they run out of the gate? We're running back. They should be like Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman were a good two headed monster for them last year. Um, the only thing is wide receiver wise court Cortland Sutton. Is he ready to take the next step? Emmanuel Sanders. What are we going to see out of you this year? Deshaun Hamilton. That's your one, two, three. And then the big guy that they drafted in the first round, Noah Fant, how much can we expect out of that? And can these guys help elevate? I'm going to say elevate Joe Flacco to where we actually think of Joe Flacco as a threat again <laughs> and not just like we saw in Baltimore last year, where it's like, so uh, when's Lamar taking over? Like, yeah. is this just going to be a so when's Drew getting the ball? I don't know if it's that just because Drew Lock is still Drew very and Lamar young. Drew Lamar were different. Yeah. I mean, On different levels coming out. Yeah. 
I would say Lamar was more pro ready than Drew Locke. Ooh, no. I think because Drew of Locke his natural run, ability. I, I think Drew Locke can run. I mean, they had to change up the offense for mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson to even be able to run that offense in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. They had to go to a, such a, a run heavy offense. I think Drew Locke could step into this offense and run it. I don't know how well he'd be able to run it, but I don't know. I don't. I don't think you have to change up the offense too much for him. Unlike you had to do with Lamar Jackson. Lamar mm-hmm. Jackson is just more physically gifted yeah. than than Drew Locke. I mean, he's probably one of the most physically gifted quarterbacks in the NFL. It's just mm-hmm. about all putting it together. I I don't think that they do that. I think with this defense, they'll be in a lot of games, mm-hmm. and there won't be a reason to take him out. Okay. I think it'd just be more on. The lack of talent. I think you need to have Drew Locke mature a little bit more as a quarterback than putting him out there. Mm-hmm. I don't think Flacco would be bad enough to bench him. So, what about let's move over from Denver to Oakland? Yeah. What do we it's like? Hard knocks, a B coming in. You've now got um, what Vontez Perfect. On this team as well. Christ. Richie Incognito's on this Jesus. team. It's going to be a great watch on HBO. I can't wait to watch it. Do we expect anything Did on the Did they really say Burfitt? Yeah, they've got Burfitt and they've got Christ. Richie Incognito on I know, this oh, team. I know they have the Incognito, who yeah. I think it was already suspended. Correct me if I'm wrong on I that. I think so. I think, um, yeah, he is. Yeah, so this team's going two and four because they're going to be an absolute train wreck. Mm-hmm. Where, where do they... Which pains me to say because friend of the show Mo Hurst is on this team. He's right there on that defensive line. Dude's getting paid. Who cares? <laughs> um, he could win a Super Bowl later in life. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I, this, I don't think Derek Carr is going to have a bounce back season. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're ever going to see that peak Derek Carr that we we saw what when he threw 30 touchdowns and four interceptions, something like that, 28 touchdowns, four interceptions. I don't up. think we're going to see that level of Derek Carr out there. We're gonna probably see, you know, A B B A B, but outside of those two, who's on this team that's a threat? I mean, we laughed at their draft. So you're talking about his 2015 season where he had yeah, 32 before he broke his back. Yeah, 32 touchdowns, 13 ints. Really? Yeah. Huh. That was that was the most touchdowns he's had in a season. It's the lowest amount of interceptions he had. Six. He had 28 and six in 2016. That's what I was talking about. Okay. That was before he broke his back. So 28 and six. Um. That's where I would – I mean, he was, like, top-notch. We were like, Oakland's back. Throw the parade. This mm-hmm. team's going to be back. And then he broke his back, and then they had to start – well, who was it? Connor Cook in the playoffs? Yep. Um. So, I mean – Well, him and, him and McGloin. Yeah, Matt McGloin, <laughs> uh, Penn State alum. I, I, I just don't think this team is going to be solid enough. Mm-hmm. They have a head case for an offense uh, – for a head coach. They have a head case at wide receiver. They have a head case at, a case at linebacker. They have a head case at guard. It's not going to be a pretty sight. I don't. I don't see the talent on this team and and stability on this team to see them winning enough games to even cross the six and ten threshold. I mean, when you look at it too, they have a they have a tough schedule. Too. Yeah. Well, you bring up that um, season that Derek Carr had. You want to know who his two wide receivers were, who were both a thousand yard wide receivers um, because Amari of him. Amari Cooper and Crabtree. Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree pulls free touchdown Red Raiders. Dave was upset we didn't say that last time we brought up Crabtree. So Dave, that one's for you. But and then the running back situation, they had Latavius Murray at that time. Whereas this time, yes, A B is good. Yes, Tyrell Williams is good. Like those two guys are good number ones and number twos for you to have. But your running back that you're probably going to trot out there, starting running back, is not going to be Jalen Richard. It's not going to be DeAndre Washington. It's not going to be Doug Martin. It's going to be Josh Jacobs, Josh Jacobs, the rookie that was out a of hiccup. Alabama. It was a hiccup Ayo. because in my mind I was like, Jacob, Jacobs, and I looked down and I stumbled on the ass. Um, but Josh Jacobs, a rookie running back in his first game, I don't know if he's going to be set up for success to be the same type of back that they had with Latavius Murray. Yeah, and I think another thing that was going with them was their defense was just a little bit better, and mm-hmm. there has to be that cohesiveness between those two, and there has to be a give and take between those two. And also, to take off pressure of, you know, to to you know to ease up the running game yeah. uh, for Latavius Murray was a better Derek Carr. Mm-hmm. And I think he's just going to be worse, and he hasn't been the same since that injury, and I don't think he's going to be the quarterback that we saw in 2016. But they so took I think their it's just, guy, Colin Farrell. 
He's not an impact guy <laughs> right now, at least. I mean, we, we rarely see rookies mm-hmm. like that come in and make that big of an impact. They need to be next generation like yep. Von Miller's to make a, that big of an impact to turn a whole defense around. I don't think he's going to make that mm-hmm. big of an impact. So, yeah. So the thing we will end with here is before we move on to the NFC, I am going to ask you off the cuff, Sean. We are going to decide right here on the podcast. I honestly can't remember how Mark and I did it last year. Yeah. So – do you want to end the AFC with giving our one through six or save it and they got to wait and listen for the playoff prediction? Oh, before? give out the seeds? Yeah. No, let's give out the seeds. Okay, so give your seeds for the AFC one through six. As the Dolphins at one, no. Uh, <laughs> Patriots at one, Chargers at two. They win the tiebreaker because they have a better division a record against the division than the Chiefs. They both finish at 11-5. But because Chargers go five and one in the AFC West and the Chiefs go four and two in the AFC West, the Chargers get the number two seed. Three, I have the Colts at ten and six. Four, I have the Browns at ten and six. Five, I have the Chiefs at eleven and five. And six, I have the Houston Texans at nine and seven. So I'm gonna run it down. Number one, Chiefs at thirteen and three. They get a bye along with the Patriots at twelve and four. Jaguars at number three. They are ten and six. Um, I know the Colts were also at 10 and 6, but the percentage against division is why the Jaguars are at 3. Ravens are at 4. The Chargers are 4 at 10 and 6. The Chargers are at 5 at 12 and 4. And then the Colts are at 6 at 10 and 6. So if you are on anywhere, Blog Talk Radio, Podcast Services, we're going to roll right into the NFC. But if you're on YouTube, let us know what you guys think down below. What are your predictions? What do you think of our predictions? Where were we right? Where are we wrong? We're going to get are so much idiot? shit. They're fans. We like, are that's idiots. That's what I love fans, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're you a bloke and you don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. This is what bloke? I love. Yeah, it's a great word. Fuck, where are you from? <laughs> well, I was, I was trying to think of that maybe Boston. And I, I could see a guy from Boston calling a guy a bloke. Um, but let us know what you think of our predictions and your predictions down below. But, Sean, let's move into the NFC. If you're on YouTube, make sure to check out our AFC ones. It'll be down below in the comments. Also, I'll put it above our heads for you guys. Um, if you're on podcast services, we're just going to truck right on through. How we do our predictions is we go division by division. If you're new watching us on YouTube, we're going to start with the north, then go to the south, the east, the west for the NFC. Then at the end, give you our one through six. So, Sean, let's start off with the NFC Bears. North. Well, the kings of the north, I should say. Bears. And that's the Bears. What's your breakdown of Fear the North? Bears. Uh, <laughs> I have the Bears being the number one team again in the NFC North. I'm going 10 and 6, 5 and 1 in the division, 7 and 1 at home, 3 and 5 away, 6 and 4 against teams with winning records, and 4 and 2 against teams with losing records. I have the Packers then finishing in second place, going 10 and 6, 4 and 2 in the division, 7 and 1 at home, 3 and 5 away from Lambeau, 4 and 5 against teams with winning winning records and 6 and 1 against teams with losing records. Then in third place, I have the Vikings going 10 and 6, <laughs> 3 and 3 in the division, 6 and 2 at that spaceship, 4 and 4 away from the spaceship. Sound like four, me 3 years ago. 4 and 6 against teams with winning records and 6 and 0 against the bad teams uh with losing records. And then the Lions uh going 0 and 6 in the division, 4 and 12 on the year, 4 and 4 at Ford Field, 0 and 0 and 8 away from that place, and two and eight against teams with winning records, and two and four against teams with win, uh, losing records. So we're similar, but different in one aspect. We that just you have, didn't they, have three teams with the same record in the same division. Close though. We just have the Vikings and the Packers flipped. Is for me number one. The Bears are at 12 and four record that they Bears. were last year. The Vikings are 11 and five. We'll hope that's enough to make the playoffs this year. Kirk Cousins, let's see if he can get it done. Dalvin Cook can stay healthy. Um, the Packers, 8-8, eight eight, getting used to uh, Matt LaFleur and Mer- uh, Aaron Rodgers and that marriage they're going to have. Um, and then the Lions, 6-10, and 10, just kind of down below. And I, I feel bad every year because I kind of feel like, okay, Lions, you go sit at the kids' table while the big boys talk. But the thing I want to talk about first is obviously the race between the Bears, Vikings, and Packers. Yeah. But for you as a Bears fan, Bears. you shocked me because I was like, oh, the Bears, they can go 12-4. and four. And you're like, that is too high for the Bears. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on Chicago? Is this just a Sean, hey, maybe if I think this way, I'll be surprised when they're 12-4? and four. No, I mean, this this team is 
very talented. This team mm-hmm. is probably the second or third most talented team in the NFC. Um, I think they're either behind the Saints and uh, Rams. I, I think you can make an argument for for being more talented. But I think with the Bears, you look at last year and they were going up against a last place schedule. They mm-hmm. were going up against one of the weaker schedules throughout the whole entire uh, NFL. You're going up against the Bills. You're going up against the Jets. You're going up against the Dolphins. You had a pretty easy other AFC uh, division that you're going up against you did have to play the patriots but you played them at home so that was made your schedule even easier you look now they have the hardest schedule out of these four teams the bears packers vikings and lions mm-hmm. uh, by st- strength of schedule they're at uh, 0.520 uh, compared to the packers who are at f- uh, four po- uh, 0.488 compared to the uh, vikings who are at 0.50 compared to the lions who are at uh, 0.50 as well. So, I mean, they have the toughest schedule. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to go to mile high. You're going to have to go to, I guess, Oakland's not really that big of a uh, challenge there, but you're going to have to go play the Saints. You do host the Saints, which is easy, but you do play a team that was in the NFC Championship game last year. You play a team against the Chargers, who were a playoff team last year. You play the Eagles, who have been mm-hmm. defending Super Bowl champions previously, who are getting back their quarterback fully, finally healthy, and you're playing that in Philadelphia. Then you have to go to LA and play the Rams. Then you have to take on the Cowboys who were a playoff team last year. You have to play the Packers. You have to play the Vikings twice. You have to play the Chiefs. This is a very tough schedule for the Chicago Bears. This isn't them playing the Bucks or the you know Bills. They have a true grown-up schedule. I think mm-hmm. that's what's going to make it difficult for them to go 12-4. and four. I think this team's extremely talented. And I think they're probably better this year because they have another year under Nagy's system. They have, yes, Chuck Pagano coming in, but all the reports from camp so far seem to be that there's no true difference happening between him and Vic Fangio. And yes, maybe schemes will be different a little bit. Maybe coverage will be different. Mm-hmm. But I think these guys are professional enough to realize the change that's going on. And I think Pagano knows how to work with guys in transitions like this. He's been an, you know, a, a defensive coordinator for Super Bowl teams before in Baltimore. So I look at this defense, and I think this defense, they might not be the number one defense in the NFL again. But they're definitely going to be top five, top ten. They're going to be very, very tough. Mm-hmm. So they're going to lose games just because that defense isn't going to be unstoppable like they were last year. But I do think this offense is going to take that step up to make them more of a balanced team and probably make them more dangerous when it comes playoff time where maybe they don't have to rely on the defense too much to bail them out where you can you know trust in Mitch a little bit. Also, last year they were extremely healthy. Are they going to have that lock again? Most likely not. So mm-hmm. if the Bears go nine and seven, eight and eight, I, I would be very pained to see that, but I also wouldn't be too shocked. I'd be more shocked if they went twelve and four than they them going nine and seven. Yeah, and I mean after you talking, like I'm looking at my games and when I look at the division, I have them splitting with everyone but the Lions. And the only two games that I could flip that I'm like, okay, maybe I am too high on the Bears yeah. is Coming out of the bye, you're at home against the New Orleans Saints. I have that as a win. That's going to be a tough one, though. Saints can't play on the road. And then you're going or week they're nine much worse on the road, at least. Into Philly. That's also one where I almost thought while you were talking, mm-hmm. do I make an edit on the podcast, flip the Bears to an 11 and 5 team, which would bump the Eagles up by one win? Because you're like. Being twelve and four and saying, "Oh, Bears are going to go twelve and four, It's not going to be an easy twelve and four like it was last year. But they are capable. Like yeah. the thing where you said with P- Chuck Pagano, where our big thing when Mark and I talked about it was Mark said the biggest difference is going to be how they blitz is basically the huge thing because Vic Fangio is like, "Hey, I'm going to disguise and I'm bringing the house. Oh no, I'm bringing three. Mm-hmm. Where Chuck Pagano might actually bring four or five blitzers um, in a package. But when you have the talent that the Bears have, I don't want to be like dismiss that, but it's like it's hard to fuck up when you got the talent the Bears have. Yeah, and I, I don't think he's going to fuck it up. Mm-hmm. I mean, this team, even if he, it's it, you know play calls are bad, yeah, this team still has the talent athletically mm-hmm. and physically to make up for it. I mean, Rokon Smith's one of the fastest linebackers in the league. Mm-hmm. Eddie Jackson's the best ball hawking safety in the league. If HaHa Clinton Dix is is healthy, he's another ball hawker out there. Kyle Fuller was a Pro Bowler. You have. Probably one of the best pass rushers mm-hmm. of our lifetime, and Khalil Mack on that line. Akeem Hicks is probably you know the second best defensive nose tackle behind mm-hmm. Aaron Donald. That's not a close race, but it's pretty good to be up in that yeah. in that territory. I think the part that they fall and will fall is just going to be the times that 
Mitch isn't able to bail them out in the running back situation is, is shown to be clear. I mean, or is, is not shown to be consistent. I really like the pickup you of David be, Montgomery. You don't believe in run DMC? I, I, I really, <laughs> I, I think he was a good pick, uh, David Montgomery, but I don't know what he's going to be able to do truly as a rookie. And mm-hmm. we've seen so many times in Kansas City and in Chicago, mainly last year in the playoff game, where Matt Nagy has just gone away from the run game. So I, I don't know if this team's going to be able to be consistent enough to be 12-4. and four. Mm-hmm. I think they're very good, and I think this is, I'd feel better about them going to the playoffs than I did last year. But that doesn't make them a Super Bowl winning team. I think that they are definitely going to be in the race. I think they're a playoff team clearly as they win the division. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if the consistency will be there. And I don't know if the health will be there. And that's the biggest thing that concerns me. Here's the question that I want to ask you to kind of end the NFC North. But it puts a bow on everything. Because yeah. for me... They're also like... I have them going 5-1 in the division. Yeah. They're most likely not going 5-1 in the division. For me, the other big thing is like I expect the Bears to be a playoff team. It's who joins them. Does Kirk Cousins take that next step to finally pull the team into the playoffs? And then in the playoffs, does he actually win? Like, that's a yeah. second story. And then Aaron Rodgers, Matt, M- Mike McCarthy's gone. Matt LaFleur's in. Is it basically just going to be like, I'm healthy. We're picking this thing up as normal. I want to ask you this, because last week Pat and I talked about the quarterbacks of the NFC North. Yeah. I will ask your opinion, your answer and then I'll tell you our answers after you have. Which quarterback in the NFC North is under the most pressure this season? Under the most? The most pressure. That's a good question. Pat brought it up. Pat wanted to talk about <laughs> Guy's it. Guy's a genius. <laughs> it's not Stafford because Stafford doesn't have enough help. That's what we said. I I, I truly think Stafford's better than what he's put out there. Mm-hmm. But I think he's been beaten up so much. That his body is not there anymore. I, I think I, Stafford should have been a be- had a better career than he did, but I don't think it's fully on him. Uh, but it's not Stafford. I, I'd have to say it's Mitch because he's just he doesn't have that contract. Okay. Where yes, Kirk Cousins does have the pressure of performing for Minnesota, but also if he doesn't perform under this contract, what he has one more year left, right? Two, I think. I thought it was a three-year 88. Here, let's see. I'm going to pull it up. Okay. I, I think right now that he has one more year after this. So he still has that security of another year. And even if that, he has a bad year next year as well and a bad year this year, some team's going to give him a one-year deal and he could possibly prove it there and get another big contract. I don't think he's going to get run out of the, 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 the city if he doesn't have a good year this year. So I wouldn't say it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's Kirk and... Packer fans are going to be the last person's people to crucify Aaron mm-hmm. Rodgers. And you could write off so many different ways on where he has, you know, places out. New coach, lack of weapons, defense mm-hmm. wasn't good enough, there's no running game. There's a lot of places to write off Aaron Rodgers and to give him excuses out. So I don't think it's Aaron Rodgers. I think it's going to come down to Mitch, who has been cruci- crucified even before he put on a Bears jersey. Mm-hmm. The fact that they traded up to get him, that's immediately just going, that was immediately just the Bears fans going, what the fuck are you doing? Mm-hmm. Then being drafted before Pat Mahomes, you know, last year's MVP, Deshaun Watson, and now going into the playoffs. Nobody and knew have, Patrick Mahomes was going to be no, Patrick but, Mahomes, but though. but you look back at it, and where was Mitch Trubisky drafted? Before Pat Mahomes and before yeah. Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson was the big one. Yeah, I mean, that, that, but that's the thing is, yeah. you know, people are going to look back at it and be mm-hmm. like, see what we missed out on mm-hmm. if he doesn't perform. And I think people forget on how well Mitch did in the second half of that Eagle game. And there's a great breakdown by Brett Coleman on how Mitch does – under pressure and how he does not under pressure Mm -hmm. he's horrible when he's not under pressure but when he's up to the deadline 11 p.m needs to write three pages on a paper and it's 11 59 deadline at the same analogy 11 59 deadline mitch is hitting it and he's knocking Mm -hmm. it out and he's getting an a like mitch (laughs) it's a great breakdown definitely go check it out it's Mm -hmm. on youtube it talks about how mitch isn't you know fully using his hips on every single throw he's not he's relying too much on his arm if you shoot me the link after we record this i'll put it in the comments mitch just needs to be it, Mitch needs to win the playoff game. Mm-hmm. And if he doesn't do that, he might he might he's gonna get crucified. So That's what I'll say. The first thing with the contract is I was right. So this is oh. this is year three. Then he's got year four and then a club option for the You fifth. gave him five years? It's he's a first rounder. Like you got four like it the contract Yikes. is four plus one. 
Yikes. So this is year three. Next year's year four. And then you got a fifth year option. What was the deal though? Four years. The deal was four years, twenty nine million was the the rookie scale. So um, he made a base salary. Ooh, most of it came in. Who are you up. talking about? Uh, Mitch Trubisky. No, I said Kirk. Oh, three years. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, I thought you were yeah. talking Mitch. No, not okay. Mitch. Okay, no. Kirk is, this is two of three. Yeah, M- Mitch is coming up on his contract. Yeah. But it's 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 not really about that. I mean, it's it's more about actually winning a playoff game. Yeah. Kirk, what I was saying was, he, I thought he's got, you were talking about Mitch's contract. Kirk has one more year after this, correct? Yes. So what I'm saying is, he's going to get his money. He already mm-hmm. got his money. It was all guaranteed. Yeah. And he's got one more year to possibly do something in Minnesota mm-hmm. to just make sure that he guarantees more money for himself. And if not, they walk like walk yeah. away. Um. So you are right on the nail with uh, Pat. Pat came in and shocked me and said, Mitch Trubisky, I'll leave his reasoning. You can go check out the segment. I was on the other side. I kind of tossed between Kirk and Rodgers before saying Aaron Rodgers just because of the whole pushed the coach out, brought this coach in. All right, now without Mike McCarthy, can you win? But for me, it's like Kirk Cousins has got pressure. Mitch has got pressure because as a third-year quarterback, how many – how many quarterbacks in year three are projected? And I know Chief fans are going, <coughs> Patrick Mahomes much, um, because he's also in year three. And it's like, oh, Super Bowl quarterback, and he's amazing. But Mitch and Mahomes are on different levels but in Goff my was. mind. Um, Goff, too. Goff, just need, for him, just needed the right coach. Technically, Wentz was as well. Wentz, too. He just gets injured, and then Nick Foles gets him a Super Bowl ring. Um, well, that was – wasn't he a sophomore when they won the Super Bowl? I think so. So, I mean, third year, they had Super Bowl expectations because mm-hmm. they just won the fucking thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of on par with that. But let's move on into the South. What's your breakdown of the NFC South? One of the toughest divisions usually every year. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is I have. <laughs> Do the, we get a new winner? Because uh, usually we get a new Yeah, winner. I have a repeat. So, it's probably going to be mm-hmm. wrong. Uh, shocker, I'm wrong. Uh, Saints going 12-4, and 5-1 and one in the division. 8 0 at home again, 4 and 4 away from the Superdome, 6 and 4 against teams with winning records, and 6 and 0 against teams with losing records. Then have the Panthers coming in at second place, 9 and 7, 3 and 3 in division, 5 and 3 at home, 4 and 4 away, 3 and 6 against teams with a losing or against a winning record, and 6 and 1 against teams with a losing record. Falcons 9 and 1, 3 and 3 in division, 5 and 3 at home, 4 and 4 away. Four and six against teams with a winning record and five and one against teams with a losing record. And with the Bucks, four and twelve, one and five in the division, four and four at home, zero oh and eight against uh, away from uh, Raymond James, uh, one and nine against teams with a winning record, and three and three against teams with a losing record. So if we were making sandwiches in the NFC, so far you and I, we like the same kind of bread. We have different insides to our sandwiches mm. because... Are you a turkey boy? Much like you, I am a turkey I'm a boy. ham guy. Yeah, I'm a turkey guy. Are you a, a turkey mayo guy? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a mustard ham guy. Okay. That makes a lot of sense, Ricky. <laughs> because the reason why I say that is I've got the Saints at number one, 13 and three, but at number two, I don't have the Panthers, claw up. I've got the Falcons, which you could also say claw down because I guess it's swooping and they've got claws as Isn't well. it a talon? Um, a talon down. Dumbass. Um, <laughs> They're at nine and seven. <laughs> then the Panthers are at seven and nine, third place. And then the swash swashbuckling um, Buccaneers are at thirteen and three. They're in the cellar. So I mean, you and I, Saints and Bucks. Yeah. But that innards, that's the difference. Well, do you have the Panthers and Falcons at the same record? Nine and seven, seven and nine. I have nine and seven both. Okay. So it's. I mean, you can really <laughs> flip them. I don't give a shit. So um, the two things I was gonna say, talk about with this one, the Saints. We don't need to discuss that. They're going to be really good. Well, I do want to discuss they're it because gonna, do you see them not finishing first? Is no. There, is they're there... going to come out with a vengeance and have a really – like, that's the thing I was talking about earlier. I'm glad you mentioned that because I would have totally disregarded it. I see this team playing pissed off this year yeah. to where they're going to be like, well, fuck you guys. Fuck the miracle. Fuck last year taking the Super Bowl away from us. It's We're Drew taking Brees it this year. year. Like, this is our year. And they're just going to come out PO'd. And have a really great season. Like they'll fin- still finish thirteen and three, mm-hmm. but in the playoffs they could possibly run the ship. I still have them pulling a Saints though. I still have them starting <laughs> one and two again in the season. I have them losing to the Rams too. Oh, do I have them doing the same thing? Do you I, have them start one and two? No, I have them starting six and zero to start the season. Jesus First Christ! Loss against the Bears. 
Go Bears! <laughs> um, and yeah, then their losing... other two are divisional games, Panthers and Falcons, but losses. I've been losing Rams, Seahawks, Bears, Falcons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that Rams game, I can't wait to watch that week two because you know that Saints, like the Saints, they're going to want to win that if, game because if, of last oh year. Oh, my God. If it was in New Orleans, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, no, that will be in the playoffs. Who's the team, though, that you think that would take them over? Like, if there is a team. I would say that in this division, the Falcons. And the only reason why is because the one thing that Falcon fans, it was a near sight on our preview that Mark and I did. Yeah. They were decimated with injuries last year. Yeah, they were killed if, by them. If they're a healthy team, I don't know if they win the division. I don't know if they're 12-4, and 13-3. Yeah. and three, But as a healthy team... This Falcon team at best could be an 11 and 5, 10 and 6 team. Yeah, they were without Deion Jones. They were without uh, Devontae Freeman. They were out without uh, Neil, their yeah, safety. Yeah, uh, Neil. Um, what's his first name? I, w- I wanted to say Nikhil now. No, uh, he brought, brought I that almost up. said the uh, same thing, but it's uh, he's out of West Virginia. That's yeah. Um, but yeah, they they were decimated injury wise. I just don't trust Dan Quinn Ke- at all. Keanu, Keanu, Keanu Neil. Neil. Um, I don't trust Dan Quinn at all, and mm-hmm. that's really what it comes down to. And I know Matty Ice was an MVP, and he had that great season. I, I don't know if he is I, – I don't know what Matt Ryan truly is anymore. Mm-hmm. And also, your best weapon is one of the best weapons in the entire NFL. But Julio Jones just is not consistently healthy enough. Is he better than DeAndre Hopkins? I mean, fantasy-wise, I said one of the best. Not. I said okay. one of the best. I didn't okay. say he's the best. Um, but no, I, I just I, – I don't know if they have it – I would say the Panthers more will be the team to take them over just because that defense is consistently good. Mm-hmm. Ron Rivera is a, a, a great head coach. And if Cam is healthy, we know that he can be a, a good quarterback. Matt Ryan's better. I know that Falcon fans would be like, how could you say that? You know, Matt Ryan's not consistent and then be like Cam Newton. Uh, but it's because Cam Newton has Christian McCaffrey. Mm-hmm. And, and that guy is an absolute game breaker. And I would I, I can't wait to see what he does with just more touches. I think that that's what it's going to come down to is the coaching and then having that weapon be mm-hmm. healthy and Christian McCaffrey being younger than Julio Jones, Julio Jones consistently dealing with nagging stuff. I'll take the Panthers to possibly upset the Saints if there is a team out there. I don't think it's going to happen, but if there is a team, I'd say the Panthers. I want to ask you this. This is a quote from Julio Jones this offseason. This was from maybe a week ago, mm-hmm. the 24th of July. He told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that Wednesday. Here's the exact quote. I'm going crazy this year. I'm going crazy. I've been doing everything that I need to do. I'm taking care of my body physically and mentally. I'll be ready to go. I hope so. I'm not a prediction type guy, but I might mess around and go 3,000. Could Julio Jones no. be the first receiver <laughs> to, to break 3,000 yards? No, no. <laughs> to break 2,000 yards. <laughs> and 3,000. And 3,000 yards. Because I think Calvin set the record with 1,900, I think. Um, so, I don't, so Calvin Johnson holds the record for a single season. 1968? 1964. Fuck! In 2012. Um, Jones had 1871 in 2015 and ranked second behind Johnson. And what he had... what Because I know Calvin had like... Four touchdowns in his it is near two thousand yard season, and I think Julio probably had like five. I'm gonna look it up. Um, I'm pulling him up for because that was the crazy thing when I was I was I forget when I was looking at it, but it was just like <laughs> Calvin Johnson. I was like, oh, he probably had like a fifteen you know touchdown mm-hmm. uh, season that year. It was like four. So Julio had let's see eight touchdowns. Okay, that that's year. decent. Um, not his most though. His most came in his sophomore season with ten. Calvin Johnson. Had five. There it is. He had five touchdowns. Could you imagine getting nineteen hundred yards. The next year, and then having five touchdowns. The next year, he had five hundred less yards, twelve touchdowns. It sounds about right. Um, but yeah, I no, I don't think Julio Jones is going to get three thousand yards. Okay. I do want him to be healthy though, because I want to see a full sixteen games from Julio Jones. Mm-hmm. If if you get a full sixteen, they they're probably better than Panthers. I just mm-hmm. don't think they're going to get that because you know they're he's never healthy. Yeah. Well, it's just bad luck. Also, uh, Julio Jones fans and Falcon fans, go check out What's Your Fantasy because from last week, um, Brandon actually had a question that he asked on the podcast. Someone from his league asked, uh, does he want Julio Jones for the first overall pick mm-hmm. in the draft? But it's a keeper. Brandon league. holds it. Yeah, so yeah. Julio's going to be his keeper. Should Brandon trade that number one pick 
for Julio Jones. I told him to wait and see who's um, draftable, but you can go to Watch Your Fantasy and give your intake there because Brandon needs it. And then the last team I just wanted to hit in this division is the Buccaneers. Mm -hmm. Like, they're a team where I don't expect them to be good. I think 3-13 and is actually, like, a blessing in disguise for them because then that team can say, well, see you, Jameis. We're going to, like, Bruce Arians can just do one of these, say, hey, he's not my guy. I'm going to go get a guy in the draft or go get one in free agency. Are we too low on the Bucks? Are no. they actually going to be like a 6-10 and 10 team and might be out of the top five in the NFL draft? They'll be better than what they were last year, but I, I think this is the first step of cleansing this team mm-hmm. and making sure that you can build the team you know, for, for Bruce Arians. Yeah. Um, you, you saw that in the move that they got rid of uh, Gerald McCoy with. I mean, mm-hmm. he was there for years, and they, they were just trying to clean out house, and they needed to get new voices in that locker room, and that's what they needed to do with Gerald McCoy. Gerald McCoy was a leader on that defense, and I think they're looking to clean out this whole team. Mm-hmm. And I think that what they're trying to do, or at least what I'm assuming they're doing, is they're going to let Jameis speak for himself. And if Jameis can be decent out there, then they will you know, go with Jameis. But I, I think that they understand that Jameis is not the guy that they drafted. Mm-hmm. He's not the guy they were hoping they drafted. And I think yeah. that they're probably going to be looking into the quarterback market next year. So there are definitely some pieces in this team that I'm interested in. The Bucks, Devin White, seeing how he'll perform, he's definitely going to be pretty interesting. Um, I, I'm looking at you know how Sue will perform there. Vita Vea, I re- you know, we were really high on him coming out of Washington last or, uh, two years ago. I want to see how he will do. This defensive line looks pretty decent. Uh, Noah Spence, Vita Vea, Sue. Ndamukong Sue. Ndamukong Sue. And Jason Pierre-Paul. I mean, like, they, they have a lot of talent there. It's just where the linebacking core and the secondary kind of fall off outside of Levante Levon- Le- 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 David. Um, I don't really know who's a stud in that that secondary linebacking core. I mean, you look at that, you know, offense and outside of Evans and Goodman, or Goodwin, I don't really know what well, they really, have offensively. Can O.J. Howard stay healthy? And can he be used well enough? I mean, yeah. will they be able to use him? I mean, Bruce Arians isn't a, a guy that heavily uses a tight end, at least doesn't use uh, tight end, or two tight end sets, uh, uh, setups a lot. Mm-hmm. And I don't really ever remember an Arizona Cardinal tight end having a great season with Bruce Arians. So I, I don't know if he'll be— Because Cameron Braid, I think, also got used that paid, well. too. Yeah, he's, in, he's entering year two of yeah. his $40 million deal so, over six years. I don't really, and they don't really have a running game. So overall, I don't see this offense being mm-hmm. great. I think it'll be an improvement, yeah. but I think that what's going to hold them back is the running back situation and probably Jameis. So I don't think they have a consistent enough quarterback, and I don't think they'll have a consistent mm-hmm. enough defense to win enough games. Well, let's move on. The next division is the NFC East. How's it breaking down, Sean? I have the Philadelphia Eagles going 12 and 4, 4 and 2 in the division, 7 and 1 at home, 5 and 3 away, 4 and 4 against teams with a winning record and 0 and 8 against teams with a losing record. At the boys going 11 and 5, 5 and 1 in the division, 8 and 0 in Jerry World, 3 and 5 away, 5 and 3 against teams with a winning record, 6 and 2 against teams with a losing record. I have the Washington team going 5 and 11, 2 and 4 in the division. Five and three at home, zero and eight uh, against uh, or away from FedEx Field. Two and seven against teams with a winning record, and three and four against teams with a losing record. And I have the lowly New York Football Giants going two and four, one and five in the division, two and six at home, zero and eight away from MetLife, zero and eight against teams that are good, and two and six against teams that are with a losing record. You and I, my friend, this is the only sandwich that we are. Buying the same one because I sense. have the exact same order. I don't know how many people are going to have an order that's opposite. I, of I it. think this is the clearest division. The only teams that could flip are the Eagles and Cowboys. Maybe Redskins, Cowboys, but yeah, I agree with you. Um, Eagles at one for me, eleven and five, five and one in the division. Cowboys at two, nine and seven, um, three and three in the division. Redskins five and eleven, two and four in the division. And then the Giants, 3-13, and 13, not going to be a good one. Daniel Jones starts midseason, um, and that's when it kind of derails and goes down rail because he wasn't supposed to be drafted that high. Um, and that's my NFC East. Before we get to the real teams, um, or I should I want to say real team, but the team I'm going to bring up is um, a real team. Before we get to the Eagles and why they're probably going to win this division, 
I want to ask you about the Cowboys. What do you think will be their season story this year? And will Zeke actually hold out regular season games? Or will well, this be a, think, we're going to give him the money and he's going to show up week one? I think you answered their question and what the storyline will be is it's going to be Zeke. Mm-hmm. No matter whether it be him showing up and playing or him being out, that's going to be the storyline. Because this team's going to go as far as he goes. Because if he's playing well and he's out there playing, mm-hmm. Dak's going to be playing better. That's going to take more pressure off the defense. And that defense's talent will be able to shine because it won't be on the field as often. And if it's you know lacking it, the team lacking Zeke and he's not out there, that means Jason Garrett's going to be able to do, need to have to do more offensively and, and be able to scheme and be able to you know bolster this this pretty mediocre team when it comes to offensive talent. I mean, mm-hmm. you're relying on a 36 year old Jason Witten as your true pass catcher. You lost Alan Hearns. You lost Cole Beasley. Who's the guy out there that's going to be catching passes? So I look at this team and I, I'm very concerned about this offense without Zeke. Yeah. Do I think he will? Yes. Because I think that people are not going to take the Le'Veon Bell route because mm-hmm. I think he'll get more money if he goes out and plays. So I think in the end he will play. I think he might not get the extension, but something will happen that he mm-hmm. will will change his mind. And I think that if he does, this team can be a f- true powerhouse. But if they if he doesn't, this team's going eight and eight, seven and nine. So my predictions reflect the entire Ezekiel Elliott um, situation because the first thing before I say how I have it playing out is think back to 2017 where the Cowboys were a. Five and three team looking good. Hey man, like how many games could they win? Boom, Zeke suspension happens. And it's like, well, great. Now he's got to miss six games. And in those six games, they lost the first three, won the last three, went three and three. They still had Zeke. They might have had a better record than seven and nine that year. And I don't remember where I heard it. I think it was someone on ESPN said it. And I heard it, and I'm like, I can, pl- I can completely see it going that way. Um, so how I had it was that same way it was described. I think someone on ESPN said it. Week one, no Zeke. They lose. Week two, no Zeke. They lose. Jerry Jones comes in, gives him, gives him money, and saves the day. And says, you know what? We got our guy back. And then it's business as usual. Like, yeah, will they probably still lose to the Saints in New Orleans? Will they still split with the Eagles, lose to the Rams, lose to the Bills, lose to the Patriots? Yeah. But to me, the Zeke situation will define how the Cowboys do. Because without Zeke, I could see the Giants might be a stretch. I mean, with Eli week one, maybe not. But yet again, their receivers are all hurt. Yeah. Um, but the Redskins, I could see them, even without wide receivers, with Case Keenum, could upset the Cowboys without an Ezekiel Elliott out there. I Just could say, see say, that, say that sentence again and try not to laugh. I could see the Redskins, without <laughs> Zeke, upsetting the Cowboys. The Cowboys without Zeke. Without Zeke. You said Redskins. Okay. If the Cowboys <laughs> have Zeke, they win both of those games. They're, in my mind, with Zeke in 11-5 and five teams. Uh, without Zeke? With Zeke. With Zeke, I have him as 11 5. Okay. So I agree with you there. Uh, without Zeke, I said 7 and 9, 8 and 8. Mm-hmm. I, I just think that, you know, I have them, you know, uh, beating the Rams in week 15. I have them beating the Eagles in week 16. I have them beating the Vikings in week 10. Like all those can, I have them beating the Packers in week 5 uh, with Zeke. But if they don't mm-hmm. have Zeke, I think all those four can flip. Yeah. So it's definitely dependent on. Getting Zeke back because mm-hmm. it's going to make your year one of uh, Kellen Moore's first uh, year as offensive coordinator much easier having Zeke out there. I mean, right now, if Zeke doesn't sign, it's Alfred Morris, correct? Yep. So you're relying on a 30. Are they just re signed? Three year old? Yeah, they just re signed him. Uh, 33 year old running back in Alfred Morris to be your bell cow. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't see the positive yeah. ways that this turns out I'm just gonna without li- Zeke. I'm just going to list them. So you got Alfred Morris, who they signed. You've got Darius Jackson, um, Tony Pollard, who's a rookie, Mike Weber, who's a rookie. Um, you've got Jordan Jordan Cahoon, um, Cahoon. Jamizi Alawali, and then Ryan Yurachik. So they have Those nobody behind Zeke Elliott. Mm-hmm. Thank you for proving that point. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just I do not see it happening. Mm -hmm. I I don't see it happening without Zeke. If they if they have Zeke though, this team's incredibly talented yeah. on the defensive side of the ball that I think that they can make lives a nightmare for teams in the NFC. Mm -hmm. I think you could possibly look at this team and you know Saints have a very good defense. Bears obviously have a very good defense. Vikings have a very good defense, but. If they're clicking on off cylinders, I think that they could be the best defense in the in the in the NFC. And you think Zeke is going to get something contract extension before the season starts, so that he's not going to miss a single regular season game, or is it going to be a eh? You called my bluff. I'm blinking first. Basically, a Friday night light situation. You called my bluff. I'm going to come in and play. I think it's that one. Okay. I think it's he he will play because of that. I think he'll just come back because he wants to play and prove a point. Mm -hmm. And I think that they will call his bluff pretty much. And my Friday Night Lights fans, I am not downplaying the significance of the of the holdout in that show because it was not over just a few dollars, but that's kind of um, the way I was going to describe it. What about the Eagles, though? They're a team that they make a trade for Jordan Howard. He's now their starting running back. They make a trade for Deshaun Jackson to where now their starting three are Alshon Jeffrey, Deshaun Jackson, um, Nelson Aguilar, but they also got Broxton Miller coming in. They also drafted um, J.J. Arcega Whiteside coming in, Carson Wentz, Zach Ertz. Is this offense going to be able to click soon enough to where this team is just, boom, the favorite to well, win. you didn't even mention. They also have Jordan Howard, too. And Jordan. And, well, and, yeah. And, Jordan Howard was the first one I said. Oh, you did? Yeah, trade oh, for Jordan Howard. My bad. I thought you heard Desha uh, I heard Deshaun Jackson first. Um, Jordan Howard, Miles Sanders, I Corey might have Clement. Spoke. I do that from time to time. Josh Adams. I think really looking at this offense, I mean, there's no way you should not be excited for this mm -hmm. Eagle team. I mean, this Eagle team's going to be a monster uh, to stop. I, I absolutely love Alshon Jeffrey when healthy, probably because he's a former Bear. Uh, Deshaun Jackson, obviously a, a massive burner out there. Nelson Aguilar has been a consistent uh, target for uh, Carson Wentz to hit when Carson Wentz is, is healthy. And I think it all boils down to this being the best offense if Carson Wentz is healthy and mm -hmm. is returning back to form. Yeah. Because if we see that Carson Wentz again, mm -hmm. I think they could be absolutely unstoppable. Because, I mean, this team with well, th that's my Doug only Peterson's— thing is, is he going to be healthy? And if he's not, I think you like, have to if he assume, goes down, I think you have to assume he is. If it, he goes down, what, Nate Sudfeld's your guy? Yeah, if if he is healthy, which I think you have to assume he will be, mm -hmm. I think you can make the bet that this would be the best offensive team in, in, in the NFC because you could make the argument for the Saints, you can make the argument for the Rams. My counter to that would be Rams, we're not sure about Todd Gurley, and he's really probably the true MVP of that offense when mm -hmm. fully healthy. And then the other one with the Saints is, Yes, you have Kamara, but you lost Mark Ingram. Drew Brees is getting older. You lost Ben Watson. That tight end situation is pretty thin. Mm -hmm. I think that looking at the you know three wide receivers they have, the two running backs that they have in Sanders and, and Howard, the massive weapon they have in Zach Ertz, and that offensive line, if Carson Wentz is near his MVP level, mm -hmm. This team will be unstoppable offensively. Yeah, I wonder if this team can be what they were his second year, so 2017. Yeah, were a Super Bowl year. Yeah, well, yeah, it was a Super Bowl year where they were 11 and two, and then boom, he got injured against the Rams. It's like holy crap, what are they going to do? Um, that year though, they had three guys over um, 750 yards: Ertz, Alshon, and Aguilar. Now you add um, Deshaun Jackson into that. Um, and the big thing is Jordan Howard. Can he do what LeGarrette Blount did for them that year of like, hey, I'm going to give you good games and I'm going to give you a performance of like 750 yards plus. I know that Blount didn't get into the touchdown category as much as fans would have wanted him to, but he gave you yards on the ground. It was able to provide some power up the middle. Um, really, to me, it's just... Injury, 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 injury. Can Carson once stay healthy? If he does, this is a playoff team, and then we'll see what they can do in the playoff. I feel like may, they won't be one or two because the Saints and Rams are really good teams, but this will be a team that fights with the Bears, fights with the Vikings, fights with the Cowboys, the Packers, for whoever is going to be that third seeded, third and fourth seed along with them if the Eagles are able to to win the division. Yeah, the only the only 
question mark I really have about mm-hmm. them is their defense. Um, yeah. You lose Bennett, right? Yeah, yeah you Margo lost ba- Bennett. Yeah, you lost Bennett because Bears- yeah, the Patriots got him. Mm-hmm. The linebacking court seems fairly thin to me, and if Michael Jen- or Malcolm Jenkins goes down, I-, I-, I worry a lot about that that secondary because that's where the Bears picked on him last year the in thing- the playoff game was picking on Craven LeBlanc, picking on Avante Maddox, mm-hmm. and if they're able, if they're not able to, like Sidney Jones isn't able to take that next step up. I, I worry about that. I, I, I will worry about that secondary. The so only thing I'm going to say about that, and it's not a like, hey, yeah. be all fix all, but I was kind of upset when he left us to go there. Sendejo. Behind yeah. Jenkins is now Sandejo, who is a good starting safety if you need him there if Jenkins goes down. But it, I, I just think it, it's not really about the talent of mm-hmm. Malcolm Jenkins. It's more about the leadership because he okay. is he is that guy. Him and Fletcher Cox are the guys. Mm-hmm. Um, at least leadership wise on, on that defense. So if, if he goes down, which you know he is older, that could really hurt this defense significantly. But I don't think he will. And I think this team's gonna be twelve and four. Mm-hmm. I think this team is clearly the cream of the crop when it comes to the a- NFC East. What about the let's move the last division we got a hit? And that is the NFC West. Sean, how's it gonna break down? I have the Los Angeles Lambs going thirteen and three, four and two in the division, oh and eight at home. If you, Eight, no. if you weren't listening, it sounded almost like you said the Los Angeles Lambs. Los Angeles not Lambs. The, Rams. <laughs> the Los Angeles Lambs are going 13 and 3, 4 and 2 in the division, 8 and 0 at home, 5 and 3 away, 7 and 2 with a winning record, and 6 and 1 against teams with a losing record. Seahawks, 12 and 4, 4 and 2 in the division, 8 and 0 at home, 4 and 4 away, 6 and 3 against teams with a winning record, and 6 and 1 against teams with a losing record. I have the 49ers going 8 and 8, 4 and 2 in the division, 4 and 4 at home, 4 and 4 and away. Four and six against teams with a winning record, and four and two against teams with a losing record. And the Arizona Cardinals, four and twelve, zero and six in the division, two and six at home, two and six away, one and eight against teams with a winning record, and three and four against teams with a losing record. Also, shout out to our boy Brian Fuentes, Mm -hmm. and also Kyler Murray, going to be the quarterback of that team. He's not my boy, not not our boy, but he's going to be the quarterback. For me, it's what? Who did you have number two? The Seahawks? Yeah. So Sean and I are the same. I've got I took a sip the, of water right when you asked me that question. The Rams at 13 and 3, 5 1 in the division. The Seahawks at 9 and 7, 3 and 3 in the division. The 49ers at 9 and 7, 3 and 3 in the division. And then the Cardinals, 2 and 14, 1 and 5 in the division. The way I kind of see this one going is it's simple. The Rams are going to be good. The Cardinals are not going to be good. Are they going to be 2-14 and 14 bad? You may argue and say, no, they'll win four games. No, they'll win five games. The point is they will probably be in fourth place of this division. The thing I want to focus on here is that middle of this division. I'll let you start with whichever team you want to go into. Seahawks, 49ers. How does it break down this year between those two teams in the divisional hunt to be behind the Rams? I think people are going to be sleeping on the Seahawks. Russell Wilson's a top five quarterback, and you just gave him. I mean, unfortunately, took Doug Baldwin away uh, due to injuries, mm-hmm. but you just gave him Tyler Lockett, who was arguably the best downfield wide receiver last year. I think when Russell War- Wilson targeted him down the field, he had like a, a perfect passer rating. Mm-hmm. I mean, like those two are a perfect pair. And to go along with that, you gave him a 6 4 freak who is. Running a four three five forty, so this offense is literally just going to be run the ball, play action verts. That's mm-hmm. all they're going to do, and it's going to work because they are that dangerous when it comes to Tyler Lockett, D- DK Metcalf, and I think the concerns are going to lie in the offensive line, and then which running back is going to step up and be the guy. Mm-hmm. But even if that situation isn't solved, it worked for them last year. And if this offensive line can just be middle of the pack, this offense will absolutely click. And you look at this defense, it's not, you know, Legion of Boom good. It's never going to be that good again. And they lost another piece in Frank Clark who they traded away. Mm-hmm. But they, they got LJ Collar from, mm-hmm. from TCU. Um, and they don't have a really, you know, stud on that uh, defensive line. And I don't really know if they have a stud in the secondary but they do have probably the best middle linebacker in the in the league, and that's Bobby Wagner. And mm-hmm. I, I think in the well, end— Well, if you ask Madden, he's a 99. 
you know, because he's the best linebacker <laughs> in the league. Um, but I, I truly think that they won't be, you know, number one in the league good, but they'll be good enough. And at home in Seattle, that defense is just going to get that much stronger. So I, I think Seattle is going to be a team that it's going to be difficult for them to win on the road going four and four, but at home they'll be able to take care of business. And they, and they have some pretty easy games at home too. Toughest ones being Saints and Rams. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, they have the Vikings two Vikings coming off a bye. But outside of that, I, I see a fairly easy schedule when it comes to home record and they at least yeah. get you know seven to eight wins at home and when it comes to the home record as well the three teams that i have them losing to at home are the saints who are really good yeah the rams who are really good and the vikings who i will say till the day i die we should have won that game i got screwed by the refs in seattle um where we lost 21 to seven so three ones where it's like okay i could possibly see that I just, for the Seahawks, I feel like it's going to be, they were 10-6 and six last year. At worst, they're 9-7. and seven. Like, they might take a game dip. They might stay the same at 10-6. and six. To me, the story is the San Francisco 49ers because with a healthy Jimmy G, he's got to be healthy for the entire season. I don't care if he doesn't have weapons wide receiver-wise. He doesn't have he's, got he's got George Kittle. Um Wide, you said wide receiver yeah, wise. Yeah, wide end. receiver wise. I know he's got the tight end. I don't think this team with a healthy Jimmy Garoppolo is four and twelve. I don't know if they make the playoffs. I don't know if it's like, oh, well, they're seven and nine now. I don't know if it's, oh, they're nine and seven now. But I know this team is a better team than four and twelve with Jimmy Garoppolo playing every game. Yeah, they definitely are. And you look at their. You know, their lack of wide receiver help, that's very clear. They have Marquise Goodwin, who was, you know, a downfield monster. Mm -hmm. Dante Pettis had some, you know, a couple good games with Nick Mullins uh, under center. Jordan Matthews is obviously pretty decent in Philadelphia. Wasn't, you know, their best guy out there, but he was pretty consistent. Kind of a redemption story for him. And obviously you mentioned George Kittle. Dude was a legit stud last mm -hmm. year. And I love their running back situation. You got Tevin Coleman. You got Jarek McKinnon. You have Matt Breida. All three of those guys have number one back potential. And if Garoppolo's healthy, it's going to be really on him to make this all work. Mm -hmm. I think that Kyle Shanahan will make it work, but the reason why I don't think they will be good or at least playoff worthy is because of their defense. Because they have a great secondary. I mean, they have a great uh, special teams, mm -hmm. mainly just because Robbie Gold, I just want to mention him. Yeah. Um, but outside of Buckner, Ford, and Bosa, I don't really like their defense. I mean, Richard Sherman is a name, but he's not the mm -hmm. guy anymore. Jason Verrett is consistently injured. And, you know, Quan Alexander, there's a reason he was let go from Tampa. Mm -hmm. Not only was his, 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 his actual contract bad, but I don't think he is a a, a, you know, a Bobby Wagner type yeah. player out there I just... where he can, he can lead, he can cover – and he can go blow up plays in the backfield. I think he's a very talented athletic mm -hmm. player, but I don't think he is an all-around great middle linebacker. And that's where it's like, I don't think this defense is going to be the best defense in the league. I don't think it's going to be the worst one in the league either. And the no, thing I'm not I, saying that. The thing I am interested in this year is just to see defensively how Nick Bosa, what does Nick Bosa and D Ford bring to this team because basically they got two new pass rushing toys to play with defensively. You've got D Ford who came over in a trade from Kansas city. And then you've got Nick, uh, Nick Bosa who you took in the draft and everything right now coming out of 49ers is that Nick Bosa is looking like he could be as good, if not better um, than his brother. Um, like he is going to be an absolute stud for that team. The question then becomes like, I look behind them, like, Solomon Thomas. Okay, now you get bumped because Nick Bosa's better as a younger player than you. Um, how do you contribute to this team? And Eric Armstead, who's an older player, how do you um, contribute to this team um, as a second stringer? To where I'm not crazy about, like, I like the new pass rushing. Malcolm Smith will be interesting. Um, I believe he was signed this free agency from the Oakland Raiders. Um, but after that, it's like this defense is going to blow your socks off. But 
can they put this team in situations to where it's like, hey, Jimmy, we got you the ball back. We put you in a good situation. You go ahead and bring it home, bud. Like, the offense is going to be the thing. Well, really, the quarterback is going to be the thing to win them games. It's just, can this defense be good enough to help out Jimmy G? Yeah, and I think also they don't have a true home field advantage. So I think that will make it just like difficult. I mean, like it's mm-hmm. not going to be a, a thing where you can look at New Orleans and you can look yeah. at Seattle and that's going to give you that much of an edge. Or like Arrowhead. Or like Arrowhead. Mm-hmm. I mean, like there's there's not a true home field advantage for them to really, you know, rile up this defense mm-hmm. and, and get that defense to even make it harder on the, the offense where you have, you know, it doesn't matter about the 11 guys because you also have a 12th guy coming in in that, in that crowd. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if they have the atmosphere yet around this team to make them dangerous. Mm-hmm. And I think that next year is their year because I still have them going 500. Yeah. I think they'll beat up on bad teams. And there's even a couple games that I'm looking at right now that they can definitely flip. But I th- see that having an early buy will drain them a little bit. And again, just the lack of secondary might hurt them a bit. And also, we don't know what Jimmy Garoppolo can be. Mm-hmm. What if Jimmy Garoppolo is a guy that, you know, now that he fully has some weapons and isn't playing conservatively and, you know, starts to open it up a little bit? What is if you guys throw a ton of machine? picks? Yeah, I mean, like yeah. he hasn't proven that yet, but we don't. We've never seen a full season from Garoppolo as a quarterback. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if we could put too much faith into him yet. Yeah, I'm kind of looking there. Like it'll be a mixed season. I think eight and eight, nine and like seven and nine to nine and seven is the range I see for the 49ers. But it'll be interesting to see if either of these teams, the Seahawks or the 49ers, make a jump in this division. How about we end things same way we did the AFC? What is your breakdown one through six playoff seedings for the NFC? Number one, I have the Rams at thirteen and three. Two, I have the Saints at twelve and four. Three, I have the Eagles at twelve and four. Four, I have the Bears at ten and six. Five, I have the Seahawks at twelve and four. And six, I have the Cowboys at eleven and five. So for me, number one, the Saints. They are thirteen and three. So are the Rams thirteen and three. Saints win the tiebreaker because they won the week two matchup um, in LA. Then at number three, 12 and four, the Chicago Bears. Bears. Um, right behind them at 11 and five, the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, if the Eagles would have won, that would have flipped as well. Um, then the Vikings at 11 and five being the number five. And because I changed things at the very end, like before we started recording, guess who is my surprise six seed that I did not even notice? Slipped in there. Bears. The Falcons. Yeah. The Falcons at nine and seven will be the new six seed for my playoffs moving forward. Um, but if you guys agree with anything, disagree with anything, have your own predictions, let us know what you guys think down below. You agree? Are we idiots? Are we smart? Let us know what you guys are thinking. But Sean, let's move on into the last part of our predictions. And before we get into the playoff part of it, mm-hmm. there's a surprise that I don't know if I told you that Mark and I started to do last year that I want to do this year also before the playoffs. That so we're ending also this year. <laughs> below, Yeah, that we're also <laughs> ending. Um, but if you go below your playoff predictions on the bottom of the playoff predictors, you draft should see order? draft order. What I want you to do is part A is easy, part two might be a little difficult. I, I think for me... I know exactly where I would mock guys, but just give me your top five. And if you want to go one step and say who they would draft, you can go ahead and do that. Oh. Just for your top five. Like, what would be your top five with your wins and losses? I mean, right now it's all tied because I have three teams at 12 and four, 14, so they probably need to do a coin flip. But in the order that it says Giants at one, Dolphins at two, Raiders at three, Bengals at four, Jets at five. Okay. Um, who they're drafting, I'm not sure because – Fuck it, Giants could come out and take yeah, Tua. True, good point. Um, mine's going to be Bengals, they'll probably take Tua. Um, Cardinals, they'll probably take Jerry Judy. Um, Raiders, they'll probably take Chase Young, get another pass rusher. Um, you Giants. Think they take a quarterback? Oh, they could take a quarterback. So Raiders, I don't know. Then at well, four. Well, no, you take you t- whoever is in the national championship game. Yeah. So if if you know Georgia's going to the national championship game, Jake Fromm. Jake Fromm. Jake Fromm's it's not going to be Oregon because Oregon's not going to the national championship game. Um, the Raiders at three, Giants at four, Tampa Bay at five, and that is our top five 
for the draft. Now we get into the, like, everyone's like, guys, I'm here for playoffs. Tell me who's going to win in the playoffs. Bears. How we're going to do it is for our YouTube audience um, who might not have seen the AFC, NFC, we'll quickly run down one through six yet again quickly, like actually like with matchups. Um, and then I'll give the floor to you after we do that. And Sean will take us through his whole bracket, talking it out. I'll take you through my bracket, talking it out. And then it'll be on to the football here. So, Sean, just to review uh-huh. what's your one through six for both the AFC and NFC. So the Patriots at one, Chargers at two, Colts at three, Browns at four, Chiefs at five, Texans at six. Okay. Then Rams at one, Saints at two, Eagles at three, Seahawks at or Bears at four, Seahawks at five, Cowboys at six. And then mine will be AFC, the Chiefs are at one, Patriots at two. Jags at three, Ravens at four, Chargers at five, Colts at six, and the NFC Saints at one, Rams at two, Bears at three, Eagles at four, Vikings at five, Falcons at six. So at this point of the podcast, um, for our YouTube viewers, like your bracket is just going to come up and we'll be like the small screen underneath. So I am going to give the floor to you. Right. I'll Maybe chime in if you had ask me a question here or there, but take us through your playoffs and lead us to Sean's Super Bowl winner for 2019-2020. Oh, so I give the Super Bowl winner. You know what? We'll hold we'll Take us to the Super Bowl. Okay. And then hold off. I mean, if you get to my Super Bowl, you'll probably yeah. figure out who's the winner. <laughs> Uh, in the first or matchup, would you? in the A, oh, would you? In the, I've, I've, I've made a team go this far and then made them lose before. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, first game is uh, Browns Chiefs in Cleveland, and the Chiefs win. Then in Indianapolis, Colts versus Texans, three versus six, Colts advance. Then in the first weekend of the NFC, Eagles versus Cowboys. I have the Cowboys upsetting the Eagles. Because of Zeke. If Zeke's not mm-hmm. there, Eagles win that one. Uh, then Bears versus Seahawks. That is in Chicago. And just like, I think it was 2000 and, uh, I think it was 2006, Robbie Gold was set up for the field goal and he kicks it through from 42 yards and the Bears win the game. Now, we don't have Robbie Gold, unfortunately, but we do have possibly either Eddie Pinheiro or uh, Elliot Fry or possibly a free agent kicker. But it will happen the same way, and we'll get revenge for the double doink, and it will be a 41-yarder on the right hash, and whoever our kicker is will put it through. Bears move through to who, the next round. Who were the Bears playing in that game? Seattle. Okay, it was not. It was the division okay. round. What you're thinking is it was the 20, It was the 06 season, but 07 playoffs. Okay, I remember that one now. Yeah. And Robbie, the year, was it the, the year divisional before, year? Divisional yeah. round, yeah, they put them into the the game against uh, the Saints, mm-hmm. yeah, in uh, because the year before you guys lost soldiers. to Carolina, yeah. Anyways, uh, now moving on to the next round, uh, <laughs> Patriots versus Chiefs in Foxborough. Patriots win. Chargers against the Colts in that soccer stadium. Colts win. Cowboys versus Rams in L.A. A rematch again in the divisional round. I'm gonna have the boys win it. I think if Zeke's there, I think they win. Then Saints versus Bears. In the Superdome, pains me to say it, <laughs> the Saints win that one. Oh, you ch- oh, you've changed it since I, I didn't thought, change it. I thought you. I thought originally you had the Bears going to the. Well, Super Bowl. I, I did last night, and then I woke up. Okay. Um, the la- the not last Super Bowl, in, Super Bears. The last year. time in front of me, I thought the Bears were going to be in your Super Bowl because no. I am now surprised. No, Saint- Saints win that one. Then uh, Colts go into Foxborough, and like every other year, like the Deflate Gate year, that didn't matter. Tom threw like I'm not getting into it. But <laughs> we ran the ball in the first half when the deflated balls were being used. Okay, didn't matter about the balls. It wasn't Tom's fault. Patriots won, and then uh, Saints versus Cowboys in the Super Bowl. Saints won that one. So I have the Patriots and Saints in my Super Bowl. And we'll get to the Super Bowl winner after we go through mine. So my playoffs. <laughs> Keeping them on the edge of the seats. Starting in the AFC, the wild card round. The thing I'm going to say about my playoffs before I start is they're going to probably be boring. I'm going to give the best explanation possible, but you could look at mine and go, am I looking at this year's or last year's playoffs? Because they are very, very similar. Um, First round, I got 
Chargers Ravens, just like we saw last year in the wild card round. I'm going to have the Chargers move on again. I almost wanted to pick Lamar Action Jackson, but I just I don't know if Mark Ingram's going to be enough to be the edge, the X factor to switch it the other way. So I have the Chargers moving on. Then in the Colts Jaguars matchup, I'm going to go with the home team. Although the Colts played same situation last year, went into Houston, divisional opponent, played very well, knocked their socks off. I think Nick Foles is going to get it done in the playoffs, and they are going to, him and Jacksonville are going to move on into the second round. Then in the NFC, Bears and Falcons, like the Falcons are lucky they're here in my mind because originally I had the Seahawks um, or 49ers in here. They kind of snuck their way in. So I'm going to go Bears, get it done at home to move on. And then it pains me to say Eagles and Vikings, although I would love to say Vikings get the win in Philadelphia, we exercise our demons from when we lost there in 2017. I got the Eagles winning. Like, Kirk Cousins, I am not going to pick you to win a playoff game until you prove to me that you can beat an opponent with a winning record. So I'm going to go with the Eagles in that one. Then the divisional round. Number one Chiefs against their divisional mate, the fifth-seeded Chargers. I'm going to go with the Chiefs to get it done in Arrowhead. Same thing with the Patriots. Patriots, Jaguars, we saw this a few years back. I wanted to pick the Jaguars. I flipped a coin in my head. I'm going to go with the Patriots. They will move on. So it'll be Chiefs and Patriots yet again in the AFC Championship game. Then we get a rematch, Saints and Eagles in the Superdome. Saints are going to move on much like last year. will probably be as close of a game as it was last year. And then the Rams and the Bears take battle. I almost said take flight. They face off um, in L.A., Although I would love to pick the Bears, I think that the Rams move on. They're trying to get back to a Super Bowl to try to win it. And then my championship games. You look at them, you go, am I looking at this year or last year? Chiefs and Patriots. Yes, I know the Patriots won last year. Chiefs are going to come out from the word go playing better. They will get the win in Arrowhead. And the Saints, where it all happened last year. Ground zero for Saints fans. They are going to be able to exercise their demons, beat the Rams, and move on into the Super Bowl. And I will have the number one 13 and 3 seeded or 13 and 3 record Chiefs going against the number one 13 and 3 New Orleans Saints in the Super Bowl. I'm so happy you didn't pick the Patriots. (laughs) Well, I think usually when I pick the Patriots, it's like, oh, they play the Giants and lose. It didn't end well for the Giants. Oh, they play the Cardinals and lose. It didn't end well for the Cardinals. Here's the thing is I should probably go first giving my Super Bowl champion, not Mm -hmm. only because it's very clear and evident who I'm picking. Oh, yeah. The kiss of death needs to be last. But also it's because of the kiss of death. And you're either going to piss off Jake (laughs) or, or Brandon or you're going to cancel out the Madden curse. Yeah. And... The Chiefs will win it. So you might win the the. You might actually pick the right team mm-hmm. because you're canceling out another curse. Yeah. You also are just making bad picks. But this is the first time you ever made a bad pick, an actually like decent pick. Mm-hmm. You picked the Jaguars and Giants like back to back years, and the yeah. Cardinals like you were making horrible picks. I made the Cardinals were a couple years ago. The Giants, the the Cowboys. So were these early are one. These are respectable teams that you have in your Super Bowl. I have the Patriots and Saints playing in Miami. Mm-hmm. Last time the Saints were in Miami, I believe they hoisted a uh, Super mm-hmm. Bowl championship against the Indianapolis Colts. That's not going to happen this time. Tom Brady's going to win a seventh, and I'm a insufferable Tom Brady fan. I get it. I don't care. Go Bears. Yeah, the whole the whole reason I said, or will they, is because I thought you were still having Patriots-Bears in the, in the ship. Bears. So That's the thing is, if Bears-Patriots ever faced off— yeah. I would want Tom Brady to throw for 500 yards, but the Bears five touchdowns, win. no interceptions, but the Bears win. Yeah. You just want a really close game. Tom plays nearly perfect. Yeah. But Mitch just Where plays Where it's better. all on Bill Belichick. Yeah. And it's all on the defense. Yeah. Um, so for mine, as Sean said, if you're new to the onside kick, great time to uh, check us out. But because I, we're over. I've had <laughs> Goodbye. For a, I've had for a couple of years what is called the kiss of death. I think it's like five or six years running. Um, I'd have to look back to see 
I thought I wrote it down with like all the teams that I have basically well, massacred last in year. My time, Ricky picked the Jaguars. Mm-hmm. The year before, he picked the Giants. The year before that, I think he picked the Cardinals mm-hmm. and, and then, then the Cowboys. And then the Cowboys. And that's or was what... it the Colts or Cowboys? I think it was the Cowboys. So it was Cowboys, Cardinals, Giants, Jags, Jaguars. I think it was four. Maybe the Bears. No, the we're going four. So Cowboys. Then the Cardinals, the um, uh, what team? Giants and the Jaguars. And now I got like you're right. I was thinking about this going in. First off, I was like, do I want both number one seeds in there? Because usually I'm not a number one versus number one kind of a guy. Um, but then I'm like, do I pick the Chiefs? Because then I'm just picking the Madden curse, and like, I don't want to be like. I don't want to be responsible for Patrick Mahomes being injured. But then there's the Saints, and it's like, do I want to be responsible for the Saints and Drew Brees possibly getting injured? Because usually the whole team gets massacred when I make a Super Bowl pick. And I am going to put my money on the New Orleans Saints to end the kiss of Jake death. is going to be so pissed at This you. is like, this is Jesus. it. Jesus. Like, and this is the thing, too. If this is the time that it needs to end, like, hey, the onside kick come and do an end because we're taking a step aside and we're going to uh, go back to our roots in a sense um, and kick it off that way, then it's a great time for the kiss to end. But other than that, I am sorry, Saints fans, in advance. I am sorry, Jake, in advance. The Saints are going to be my Super Bowl pick this year and just be prepared for maybe a rocky road um, now that it's officially come out of my mouth and is now kind of circling around in the air that we breathe. What are your thoughts on the uh, kiss of death for this year? Does it end or does it keep going? It keeps going because you're, I mean, because the Patriots are winning the Super Bowl. So that's why. But I, I don't think it's going to be kiss of death bad where, you know, they're missing the playoffs. They've, so that's the kiss of death. They have to like it's not the injuries. The injuries helped, but they've missed the playoffs. I I do not think the Saints will miss the playoffs. Okay, but if they do, it will be hilarious because they probably won't win the division. Uh-huh. So then it's just going to be this like there's a, another way to where like you made a bad pick because you picked the team that's you know always swapping wives and when it comes to division winners. So yeah. I I hope the Saints don't miss the playoffs because I have them in my Super Bowl, but. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you work wonders, Ricky Wimmer. Yeah, I can't wait to see if this is the year it ends, if it's not the year that it ends and keeps going. I, I'll be honest, like, I've kind of got a very sadistic mind when it comes to the kiss of death to where I don't want it to end. Like, when I pick a team, now it's like I want it to end like how Jacksonville had yeah. last year. We're like, you're a top 10 pick, top 5 pick, and I've ruined your season, like, I want it to go that way. I don't want the Saints to win the Super Bowl and to end my kiss of death. Yeah, but also you're not going out here making bo- – you're not picking no. the, the Dolphins to, yeah. to win the Super Bowl. You made a legit pick. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Jaguars were legit last year. Right? No, but this I'm saying this year was a legit yeah. pick. Like okay. this is an actual team that can win the Super Bowl. But like, you're not out here trying to like – you're, you're oh, not trying to extend the streak. Yeah, you're not yeah. trying to extend the streak here on purpose. Mm-hmm. Like you, you – st- Truly think the Saints can win the Super Bowl. Yeah, they can. So you're making mm-hmm. a legit pick here. Any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up? Go Bears. Go Bears. But this is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below of our playoff picks, our Super Bowl picks, and all that jazz. Who are your Super Bowl picks? Will the Saints um, end up being a kiss of death or will they win the Super Bowl? Also, rest in peace to the onside kick. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been a long road. It started all the way back in 2012. Jesus. Um, The first episode we recorded was Dave, Brandon, and I before the Giants-Patriots Super Bowl in 2012. Yikes. Um, And then Mark and I took it over. Um, Didn't really take it over. Like, Mark came in. We were a Chicago podcast for a while because we were Mm -hmm. on the fan side network. Then when we were football, the Mark and I edition started after the Ravens 49ers Super Bowl, whatever year that was, 2014, 2015? 2014? 2012. No, 2012 was Giants Patriots. Then 2013. Then, tw- then that next year, 2013. Um, so that was basically the next year. It was okay, the Mark and Ricky show moving forward. But next week, 
you'll get to see new and better things mm-hmm. as the uh, forward the and new, onward. The new podcast I'm very excited for. Um, Go Bears! It's the same. It's the same guys. We so. haven't Dave host. What? We haven't Dave hosted. We can if you want to. No. He hosts too old the game. <laughs> he doesn't want to. Okay. <laughs> we already know I mean, Dave doesn't want to host the podcast. He hosts too old the game. He doesn't want to host the podcast. Okay. We know he doesn't. Okay. Well, Dave will have a panic attack. Did you ever ask? Well, go Bears. It would usually take like five tries to yeah, start not. the podcast. Um, I I think it could be rotating depending on who wants to do it. But Bears, thank you guys for checking us out. We will uh, see you next time. See you next week on the new podcast. Bears. <laughs>